everybody, and a very warm welcome to this council meeting. Um, quite a big agenda, so uh, once again, appreciate the efforts of, of councillors to focus on the, the, the big issues and not spend too much time dwelling on the, the minor things um, as we work through some of the major reports that we've got in front of us. Um, so welcome to councillors and staff, to members of the public, both in the council chamber and uh, online, um, and any media that may be watching as well. Uh, just go straight to apologies. We do have an apology for lateness from Councillor Hopkins. Are there any other apologies? Councillor Holding, you're moving. We accept that. Second, it's the Deputy Mayor Halaley. Uh, those in favour, please say aye. And those against, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest? No, there's none. Um, and we'll move on to public forum. We've got several uh, speakers in the public forum. Um, so first up, we have Mike Sweeney to uh, welcome Mike. And uh, just you ready? Go for it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Waitaki Ratepayers and Residents Association. The rate increase isn't uniform. As an Amaru resident, I will get an increase of about 6%. But farmers will have to pay between 9 and 14% more. How did this happen? How can it be justified? At the May 16th hearings, it was suggested that farmers' increase had to do with roading. But there is a separate general roading rate, and it doesn't increase next year. In fact, it goes down from 8.47 cents to only 8.29 cents next year. So it's not roading that costs farmers more. The farmers increase is almost entirely caused by a 30% increase in the general rate, which is levied on land value. It goes up from 6.79 cents to 8.8 .8 cents. This is the largest jump in any major rate. The general rate disproportionately impacts farmers who hold title, often with heavy debt, to lots of land. When they learned about the increase, they were understandably upset. You will recall the Federated Farmers' submission when they basically accused council of violating its own rating policy by unfairly ta taxing land instead of people. It was a major change in the allocation of rates that has caused anger and further alienation from local government. We have monitored every public council meeting this year, and as best we can tell, there was never a specific discussion, debate, and decision in public to raise the general rate by 30%, inflicting this special burden on farmers. This important rate decision was just bundled into the whole annual plan brought before you for final ratification today. But today is only four days before the start of the new fiscal year, so as staff points out on page 36 today, you must agree to the new rates as, quote, the only option practically and legally available to council. So it's a done deal. Now, how did this happen? We obtained a list of your secret workshops in 2023 through an official information uh, request. Me, Mr. Sweeney, um, yes. please don't use inflammatory language like that. Well, I will explain so, why I call it secret because they weren't announced, no agenda was issued, and no public access was allowed. We can argue over terms, but that's the reality. Anyway, the list shows that on March 7th, you had a rates funding workshop. Presumably, this is where you approved the farmer rate increase, no doubt on the recommendation of officers who doubtless had reasons. So I'll, I'll just correct you there. We don't, we didn't agree anything. There were no decisions made at that, but it's a workshop. Well, so I understand, I, the, I understand you, the excuse. And we've, I, we've I, questioned that. Mr. Sweeney, it's not an excuse, it's an explanation. And I want you to refrain from making false statements, please. So that if you if you can't do that, then we'll just end this now. Well, I would we, just... we, we want to hear from you, but I, there's no need to bring in inflammatory comments or false statements. I respectfully your... disagree with you that it's false, but we can argue that at a different time. If you'll allow me to proceed, Thanks. I have Mr. a few Sweeney, more remarks I'm, to make. Mr. Sweeney, I'm the chair, and please don't speak over me when I'm trying to speak to you. 
So if you can carry on, but please don't make inflammatory statements or false statements. I'll continue. Presumably, this is where you approve the farmer rate increase, no doubt on the recommendation of officers who doubtlessly had their reasons, or perhaps it was just slipped by as part of a, a larger package. We don't know. We believe this is a very unfair and undemocratic way to do public business. It is unfair to the farmers because they were denied the opportunity to find out what was going on and to lobby you with their arguments before the rates were set in stone. And it was unfair to you because you were denied the information and insights that the farmers and other citizens could have provided to help you make this important decision. Now, this is only one example, but it's a good example of why we insist that the workshop should be publicly agendized and open to the public, not necessarily to speak, but to listen, to learn, and to be able to make available to you their insights and the information to help you run the council. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jeanette McKenzie. Morning. Ready to go. Is it already pushed? Yep, thank you. Good morning, all. Um, I'm a trustee on the Omro Whitestone Civic Trust. So my better brief presentation of about two minutes. Um, as you know, the Trust is a registered charity of a community-owned Victorian precinct run with two paid staff and an unpaid trust board. We have a mutual symbiotic relationship with council, whereby we pay 102000 in ground rent and rates per annum, and they, so you have supported us with heritage grants and loans, and some interest-free periods on those loans. Thank you. Of the amount we pay to the WDC, 19000 per annum is not recovered by the trust from the tenants, being ground rent and rates about half-half of each. But it does support the following loss leads to remain in the precinct. The Victorian wardrobe, Whitestone City, the stables, and subsidising the rent of a few artists, artisans who could not make a sustainable income and would close should they have to pay a commercial rent. One famous artist is a huge drawcard to the precinct, yet she is only supported financially by the OWCT and not by any local tourism or arts body. These loss leads make the precinct more vibrant and bring in people to have a look without them contributing to our income stream a win-win for our town and our region. We look forward to renegotiating our loan with you in December this year, per the terms of the original loan contract, and intend to make some lump sum payments in the meantime to reduce the debt. We need the loan to be renegotiated before year end, so that a large portion becomes a non-current liability in our balance sheet. That will allow us to access partially funded grants to do essential health and safety upgrades, namely a skylight over the children's play area that has been identified as at risk of imploding falling in, and a fire panel in the grain store that has a high risk of failing. So once again, we thank you for your support for the community-owned Victorian precinct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeanette, and um, thank you to the Trust for the work that they're doing. Um, just asking councillors whether they've got any questions or comments. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have uh, Ray Henderson. Good morning, Ray. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> right. First of all, um, I consider myself to have a sense of humour, but after looking through the agenda and seeing Mayor Kirch's attempt at a joke about secret meetings, I'm not impressed um, because that is one of the things we're pushing for: is to get workshops, be they secret or not, get the workshops open. I can assure you the ombudsman who's looking through uh, eight councils and examining their use of workshops doesn't think it's a joke. So I prefer that the making a joke of secret meetings is not, um, not uh, met with approval from us. Um, and to add insult to injury, our meeting with the mayor on the 21st of June was actually omitted from his list of meetings. So the mayor's creating secret meetings by not listing his uh, interaction with people. So, as I say, overall, not a joke, not a joke at all. Um, today's the important day of moving forward with the approval of the rates uh, schedule as it is. Uh, one of the big items which has been brought forward because of another report required is the event centre. Now, I'm not arguing against the event centre. It's obviously going to happen. Um, 
at some stage. Um, the argument is over the amount. Um, I'm concerned that the first time it comes through, we talked about a cap figure of 10 million or 12 million or nothing at all. And this time when it said 10 million or 15 million, the, the word cap has disappeared. So we know it's not going to be capped at 15 million. I don't care what you say. I firmly believe that it's going to be 18 to 20. So bear that in mind when you make your approval today. Um, what I am concerned about is the cost to the ratepayers and residents um, that taking out loans of that value at tax interest rate, be it six percent or, or less or more, we don't know because it's over 20 years. That is an overall cost to the um, the budget. Um, and on top of that, there's the operating costs, which is not really being made public. This figure is being bandied around and uh, people just sort of guessing at it, but that is always going to be a cost regardless. Um, when the loan's paid off, there'll still be an operating cost every year. So those figures, uh, the currently the interest as it stands um, and the operating costs could be around about the $2 million. So I think the council are duty bound that knowing there's going to be a $10 million drain out of the budget year on for, say, 15, 20 years, they should be making sure the budget is trimmed to try to pull that back from somewhere that, you know, look at a project, is it needed or can it be done better? Do look for a better uh, supplier. So for please, please try and find a ten, $2 million saving to offset that cost. So um, so that's where I am with that. So I said, I know it's going to go ahead, but it's going to cost, try and reduce that cost. Um, and again, referring back to um, information, et cetera, um, we need information to make uh, rational decisions, both yourselves, but you're getting it through your workshops anyway. Uh, but we need to know the information so we can make rational decisions. And in defense of uh, my colleague, uh, Mike Sweeney, in the past public forums, we speak, we say our bit, the, uh, the mayor as the chair can refute what we say, just to clarify that. And we receive questions from the councillors, et cetera, et cetera, on things we've said. We're not in a position to ask questions. We just make our statements. But it's the first time I've seen someone so rudely interrupted in this presentation. I have seen presentations before where people have been very vociferous. I can remember seeing Bill Pyle in here. And some people really do get carried away, but they've been allowed to say their piece before it's answered from council. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thanks for the tips on cheering. But uh, you'll have to understand that I don't really necessarily agree with them. Um, it, it is a responsibility of a chair when they hear some words being used that uh, aren't necessary or are untrue to actually address them at the time rather than wait to the end. I have waited to the end for some of your ones, though. Um, I'd just point out in response to some of Mr Sweeney's comments and your own, um, first of all, the, uh, I believe the workshop that he referred to was an in induction session for the new councillors uh, on the annual plan to bring them up to speed with where things were at. So, um, uh, yeah, I believe that was the, the, the example used. Um, just talking about the general rates, um, we don't normally look at where the costs are falling when we, as we go through. and decide what's what should be in or out um, but we do make sure that we provide rate examples and that was in the all the consultation document uh, and it was one of the higher rate examples um, was for the agricultural property so there was a very good heads up to the the, the rural rate payers particularly large landowners that they were getting um, or was being proposed that there was going to be a, a larger increase for them so they the opportunity for them to give feedback was definitely there and, and a very good signal given to them to um, to uh, share their voice. Um, as far as your the, the meeting I had with you, um, when, when, my, when I do my report, it's basically uh, all the list of meetings is done up and a couple of weeks before it's due and I try and update that as much as I can. Um, the meeting I had with you was at relatively short notice. It was right on the cusp of actually putting my mayor's report in, and so it wasn't um, it wasn't listed. It wasn't for any reasons that I needed to keep it secret. I'd rather shout it from the rooftops that I actually met with you and had, we had a good meeting. Um, as for my humour, uh, yeah, I 
didn't necessarily think you would get it, but uh, we, when um, it's as a response to some of the ridiculous claims that have been made, it was it was attempt at humour. So you'll hopefully forgive me for the, my sense of humour. So anyway, no, that's fine. I mean, you know, we, uh, your comment about the ombudsman. I mean, you know, we we welcome that because. Uh, if the ombudsman puts any sort of ruler against it and, and compares it to central government, we have far, far, far more uh, discussions in public and the decisions are made in public that uh, compared to what happens at Parliament. Um, councillors, do you have any comments? Councillor Thompson? Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question so that I can get a better understanding. Um, we've had two of you speak on behalf of the ratepayers this morning. Can you tell me how many paid up members of the of the ratepayers association there are? We do not have a payment fee. We have to, by donation. So if people that believe in us can donate to us. We don't force an actual fee. So consequently, we don't have it. I know you like to see how big the cohort is of, of an area, et cetera, et cetera. But by um, just by knowing the people that contact us, et cetera. We have people that don't come along for a meeting, but we know they're interested in what we're doing. So generically, we, we say there's quite a number of people following us. Um, on the basis of that argument, I could form the uh, Wahimo Tussock Jumper Society and turn up here and make representations to council and have zero credibility because um, I haven't... Uh, fronted up with the people, whereas I actually stood in the electorate of Waihemo and 75% of the people voted for me. In fact, half a percent more of my electors voted than they did for the mayor, which I uh, periodically remind them of. So I think I've got every right to sit here and make decisions on behalf of the people who supported me. Okay, if you're going to trivialise things, I'll say straight away, 75% of the people of Waihemo didn't vote for you. 75% of the people who voted voted for you. That is a totally different thing. We know that turnout in local body elections is very, very low. You'll probably find you haven't even got 50% of the voters voting for you. So you don't actually have a mandate at all. Thank you. <laughs> um, elections are a mandate. Full stop. It doesn't it, if people don't turn out, that's yeah. that's on them. Um, yeah, if yeah, uh, fundamentally, elections are a mandate, and um, you know, there's, there's no there's no getting around that. It is, it is since the times of early Greeks um, and when democracy was actually formulated, that's the way it's been. And I'm not sure that a statement from the ratepayers group to say something different is going to be uh, overturning the the um, concept of democracy and uh, you know, turn it on its head. So anyway, with that, um, I am going to close off. Oh, after the, uh, sorry, Mr. Gell. I just more. would like to say I do have a sense of humour and I appreciated the reply. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Um, we'll now move to item 4.1 uh, minutes from the 30th of May. So I'd like to move those. This is the, is this the addendum, Mayor yes. Kircher, that we received la last night. Yes. Um, Can I suggest that it lie on the table? I don't think it's appropriate that we actually um, Received these today. We, um, me, elected members only received them um, about seven, eight o'clock last night. I've made three corrections. I haven't had a chance to convey them to anyone, um, and I don't think uh, you know the, the statutory requirement is um, uh, uh, for two working days, four working days. I just don't think we should receive them. I'm sorry. What's your view? Um, we have got some other minutes which. Um haven't been able to make it to the addendum so uh, we're going to be um, receiving those on the meeting next Tuesday so we can hold these ones over until then so I, well it would well it would give I mean I know that you have said that you don't want people to correct minutes at meetings the problem is that it's it actually it's time consuming and laborious to do it any other way. So at least if I had a week to communicate with the um, 
Covenant's advisor and, and make the corrections, which are entirely grammatical and have nothing to do with content, it would be um, probably an efficient use of everyone's time. Yeah, I just just want to clarify that we it, minutes absolutely can be corrected at uh, meetings and, and should be, but if it's just uh, minor <laughs> spelling or grammatical errors, then those are things that can be just passed on separately. Um, if there's meaningful. If, if there's a meaningful difference being made in, in what the minutes say, that's when they should be done at the meeting. So um, we will uh, leave those minutes and they can come back to us next week. Um, just on the basis that councillors haven't had enough time to properly go through them. They're, they're very long um, and we'll make sure that we address them then. So uh, we'll go to my Mayor's report. Uh, yeah, so any any questions, I'll take it as read, um, any questions on that or comments? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, Mayor Kircher, um, thank you for this. I, I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of them just relates to one of your meetings, and I, uh, I, don't, I hope I don't think expect it to be contentious. But the more fundamental question, or two fundamental questions, um, with regard to the affordable water bill that's been introduced to Parliament, I, the question I suppose either for you or for uh, Mr. Palmley is: Are we proposing to submit on the matter? Because I, I remain substantially concerned that um, that a distinction in the in the um, emphasis placed on community views and uh, to mana Otawai statements. And I think that's uh, that they're discriminatory and um, and I would like to see a submit on that matter amongst others. But I understand we've got a very short period of time to do so. So is there some opportunity for us to submit or not? I'll just ask Mr. Palmley to respond to that one. Uh, so at this stage, given the timeframes, we weren't proposing uh, to submit uh, on the bill. Well, can I just suggest that um, I believe it is, you know, a fun water is a fundamental human right. And at the moment, the new legislation brought to Parliament says that the entities, the 10 entities, one of which we will be a part of, can have regard to community concerns that think about them and dismiss them if they wish. But they must give effect to Tamana Otawai statements. In other words, do as you're told. Now that is a distinction in emphasis in response, but predicated entirely on racial basis. And it's wrong. Water should be equally and universally valued by all human beings. And comments and statements and beliefs about water should be um, the same, in my view. And I think that um, this is another area where local government. Uh, should push back, and if they don't, then individual councils like ours should. So you're obviously more familiar with the uh, bill than I am uh, at this stage, but I do believe those provisions were already uh, enshrined in the uh, previous Acts of Parliament, and this bill is an amendment uh, to those Acts to uh, reflect the increased number of entities uh, and reflect some of the things that uh, we and other councils have been lobbying on on in terms of uh, increasing community voice and uh, increasing accountability and ensuring uh, that these new water, en water entities are uh, responsive, uh, not just to communities, but to the development system as well, ensuring that they're not the uh, drag an anchor on uh, development. So uh, given that those already form part of an act, I'm not sure that the bill, uh, although you may be more familiar than I am, is proposing to amend what's already gone before in those acts uh, in regards to those matters. Well, it's a new piece of legislation, and, there, and we, we can submit on it if we wish. And I'm simply asking if we intended to, and I'm raising one issue, there may well be others, that we could submit on. What you've said is we're not going to, so it might well be that each of us as individuals, if we believe we should, then can submit as individuals. Okay, we'll have a separate discussion on, uh, on, on whether we should submit um it's not something we can do off the cuff here until uh, if, if councillors aren't aware of what the, the um, different aspects are that's in the bill that's proposed as to whether they want to then submit on it. 
Can I ask um, one other question about that? Um, this is a separate matter altogether. Um, and Mr. Hope or Mr. Palmer may well be people who can answer this. On, on page um, 14, we're talking about councils needing to provide and fund water services during the extended ex establishment period, including transitional arrangements that will be inserted. Um, I'm just wondering, given that we're going to have to do this now for a longer period of time, is, is there, have you had any signal from central government that there might be additional funding provided to enable that to happen? So uh, the government has confirmed that yeah, there's not additional funding for providing water services, and that still rests with uh, ratepayer funding. But in terms of the extended transitional period, uh, they're looking at additional funding allocations to meet the costs that councils are bearing uh, in terms of you know, that transition process. Okay. Thank you. Okay. May I ask you the question about your meeting? Which one? Oh, well, it was a meeting just... Out of curiosity, you had a meeting on the 12th of June with residents re-railway crossing incident, and I'm just curious to know what that was. Uh, there was a, a vehicle hit um, at the railway crossing at um, Waitake, near the Waitake Bridge. Um, so there was uh, thankfully no, no serious injury or anything resulting from that, but uh, there were some concerns um, from the family members that they safely, uh, the safety the the crossing wasn't safe um, and that <laughs> some things needed to, to happen there, um, in particular pointing out when they, um, as they get to the highway when at night time, when you look up, it's very difficult to tell whether there's, whether there's um, heavy transport or, or a train or the light that's um, the street light, which is outside Riverstone, gets a bit confusing yeah. as to yes. what's... Uh, what, what actually might be there, and um, yeah, that leads to people making mistakes because of that. So um, I think uh, Mr. Rendell is looking and has already looked at the light situation and believes that putting some um, some some shades on that to uh, to stop the direct glare from from that light being seen would be helpful. I'm not sure whether that's progressed any further than that. Councillor Holding. I wasn't going to ask it since it's in here. Um, is there any update on the meeting with the Heinz, the first of May Heinz and Whiskey Co? Um, we're just talking about uh, you know, some of the, the buildings and uh, there was a wee bit of discussion around district plan review and what that might uh, mean for that particular area, uh, but also looking at the Northern Hotel and their long-term ambition to get that um, renovated at some, some stage, which would obviously be a a very welcome thing uh, for a you know, fairly notable building in that area. So just be yeah, quite a positive meeting overall. Anything else? Deputy Mayor? Um, just through the Chair, on a more positive note, um, just um, agreeing with you in terms of acknowledging uh, Helen Alba, QSM, for um, the work that she's done on the hospital board. Mm -hmm. And we wish her all the best and thank her for all the service that she's done with the hospital. And then also just wanted to acknowledge the Youth Council um, that attended uh, the Festival for the Future um, in Wellington. So I think those kind of events are really helpful and supportive of our youth leadership development for Waitaki. So mm -hmm. uh, well done to the Youth Council for supporting that and the Mayor for attending with them. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, so I'd like to maybe re receive that report. That's along with Councillor Holding. Thank you. Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And against? It's Harry. Okay, moving to item 6.1, the recommendation from Waihimo Community Board meeting. Um, I'm not sure, Councillor Thompson, do you want to address this one as the ward councillor? Um, this has been an ongoing issue for a number of years that um, whilst it's only a voluntary uh, request for truck drivers to not use their air brakes, um, Hamden, because of its hilly nature, um, seems to cop um, uh, quite a lot of noise, particularly in the early morning trucks, possibly empty, heading north in a hurry. Um, one of the things that I think is quite obvious coming from the south end, um, there's a speed restriction at the top of the hill that then reduces speed at the bottom. So I would imagine that truck driver's getting down and all of a sudden goes, oops, and they hit the air brakes and... Um, 
So I think it's um, it is um, important because it's, this issue has been raised a number of times with me that we take those concerns to Waka Katahi and um, ask them to uh, consider it. I know the, the request has gone through Waka Katahi's contractor and gone nowhere, um, so maybe we can um, elevate the request to um, uh, an operate from an operational to a governance level. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's certainly uh, a township which, um, you know, it's, it's a bit unusual that it doesn't have some um, signs like that. Uh, sometimes trucks have to use their engine brakes and so on, but if they can avoid it uh, in, in places like Hamden, uh, it would be much better for the, the residents, but um, as needs must, um, certainly supportive of this. Um, if someone you're happy to move, Councillor Thompson, and I will be happy to second that. I was at the meeting when Mr. Reynolds uh, spoke, and uh, he did make a compelling case. Is there any discussion on that? Okay, I'll put it, those in favour, please say aye. aye. And against, that's carried. Um, right, moving to the adoption of the 2023 24 annual plan. Mr. Hope. Thank you. Um, so I'll make three reasonably brief comments before I hand it over to Ms. McIntosh. Um, firstly, I think yeah, the the overall position uh, in terms of uh, increasing rate requirement, um, I mean, it is less than we indicated in the long term plan, and it really is just reflecting it of the uh, grappling with a, a hot, well a high inflationary environment. Uh, Council is seeing those increase in costs. Uh, and um, so I think the position we've ended up is uh, as good as could be achieved. Uh, it's you know it is probably typical of most councils that they are in this range, some with um, significantly higher increases, or um, you know, as uh, Auckland Council has made the front pages and made the national news, um, really with very significant increases that have caused them to grapple with level of service uh, discussions. Um, which uh, we fortunately didn't have to deal with, but mat we are matters that we will need to deal with in the long-term plan. Um, the second item is, uh, as this is a major decision, we were required to submit the annual plan to the Department of Internal Affairs uh, National Transition Unit for uh, sign-off. Uh, we got that yesterday, so nothing like the nick of time before you get it. Um, but I did uh, raise concerns with the NTU that um, they will need to consider how they deal with long-term plans because they will be required to sign all of those off before they are approved. Um, and they did acknowledge that they will need to improve their processes to make sure that we um, all councils are getting timely sign-off. Um, and then the third item is, again, just to acknowledge and thank the efforts of uh, officers in relation to... Uh, to this process and getting the document together, particularly the finance and strategy teams, um, yeah, made a bit more challenging by the annual report being delayed. So sort of demands on their time, particularly sort of through the uh, March, April, May period. So uh, that's all for me. So over to Ms McIntosh. Thank you, Mr Hope. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're at the final end of the adoption of the annual plan process. Uh, the recommendation, the, I'll take the report as read, but you'll see the recommendation has uh, three points uh, in particular regarding confirming the parking fees and the funding level of commitment to the Waitaki Sports Centre, as well as which will then lead to adopting the annual plan. Um, there will be some changes because of that level of commitment to be confirmed. So those are um, options have been put in the report, so we will need to make some changes, which has been delegated to the Chief Executive. Uh, just to confirm, the reason why the parking fees have been represented today is because when we presented at the uh, 30th of May Council meeting, the financials that were presented in that meeting for the savings and revenue that we could obtain were not defined and we were unable to talk to that specifically with the detail that you required. So we've represented that today to show you what those costings were actually based on. Um, and clarified that at the back of this report. Uh, so uh, whether you want to review that um, and then 
discuss the sports centre and then look at the annual plan document, which will then subsequently lead to, in the next report, the, the setting of the rates for 23-24 financial year. Okay, councillors. <laughs> Councillor Hopkins. Uh, look, a couple, uh, a couple of questions on uh, matters unrelated to the, um, the the issue of the sports and events at this stage. And um, well, three questions actually. If there are um, in the annual plan itself, I notice that uh, recommendation four delegates to the chief executive and the mayor the ability to make any final corrections and minor amendments. Um, so, if if there are one or two just things that I would suggest would improve the document. Do I convey those to you or to Alex? If you convey those through to me and then I can present them to Mr Palmy afterwards. That'd be I, shall, I shall do that. Um, they, they, I do have um, one one question of meaning in, in the annual plan itself, the actual document. I might come to that in a minute, but with regard to your report, um, I've got two questions. The first relates to... Um, the, the information on page 24 relating to parking. And the first bullet point was at the top of the page, it talks about one hour free parking offered between the hours of 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Now, I was under the impression that the one hour free parking we, that we have been offering is between nine and 10. So I'm questioning why, aren't we, isn't this in fact effectively creating a two hour free parking window of opportunity rather than the one that we resolved on the 30th of May to 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 an, an implement. Thank you, Councillor Hopson, Hopkins. And this is the reason why we wanted to clarify this here today is, in fact, our parking meters are free until 10 a.m. So the the decision that we came to on the 30th, that you came to on the 30th of May actually wasn't um, able to be implemented because of that parking meter starting from 10 a.m. So there is no fee until then. So that's the, the free time allocation was actually incorporated to provide a one hour free parking, but we don't, uh, there is no charge until 10 a.m. on any given day. But that's only because we've decided not to charge between 9 and 10. And I was under the impression on the 30th that what we decided to do was continue that, not add another hour to it. I think if we took it to this, it's extreme where paid parking finishes at I think 5:30, um, something like that. So uh, essentially, you could you could say there's 15 hours free parking. Um, taking taking your argument to the to extreme, um, the reality is we we only charge for this period of time. So if we're going to have free parking, it's within that time. And uh, what staff have indicated is that the two hours. Um, it's very difficult to monitor. It's virtually impossible. Okay. And uh, one hour is easier to monitor and, and uh, okay. it still allows people to uh, get you know, a reasonable amount of their business done, I'm sure, uh, within that time frame. I'll just pass over to Mr. Cook, who's a regulatory group manager. Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, just in reply to Councillor Hopkins through the chair, the, um, the parking hours are scheduled in the parking bylaw. And so the um, parking enforcement starts at 10. Um, and this was um, in review, this was seen the most cost effective way to alter the um, parking at the moment, because you'd have to do a schedule review and change it in the bylaw. And also all the blue signs would have to be changed, which would be um, a reasonable cost um, for the short term benefit that we'd get whilst we're doing the next review. Um, because this is a, one of the topics we need to discuss, we'll, we'll get this one out of the way before we move on to the other. Uh, topic that you want to talk about so just on on the parking it is the intention that we do get the review done of the omri cbd parking um completed by the first of october so you know we need to get on and and, and make a final decision we've got machines that are wearing out but if they're going to be replaced we need to make the decision decision to replace them but if they um, aren't being replaced then obviously that money uh, can be utilised elsewhere. So, yeah, that's uh, a wee bit of background on that particular one. Um, the 
is an increase in the annual parking permits. So um, there's a, su a suggested increase in those, uh, which is in keeping with the, the overall um, parking fee increase, um, but happy to get feedback on that. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to uh, trying you know, try to make sure that we've got a system that works well for uh, for the public and for the business owners uh, alike and uh, make sure that there's good turnover of car parking and um, that the activity covers its own costs as much as possible. Um, so any any other comments on any of those details? Councillor Blackler. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kitcher. I just, I just wanted to raise a question, um, page 28 on the um, key directions decision paper. Is, it, is this on parking? Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, on yep. parking. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's there's the the ninety thousand in um, item three on the list, um, resulting in the re point two four reduction in rates. Um, is that is that correct that we utilising reserves? Um, yeah, that is correct. Uh, but that was the estimate based on some of the initial parking work that would only be only, only an amount um, necessary to balance essentially balance up the, the budget inside of that activity would be required. Um, so if there's an increase in parking revenue, then there would be a reduction in the transfer from reserve. So it's essentially to keep the rate at the same level as the previous year. And and taking from that, Mr. Hope, um, if we return to service as usual on the 1st of October, then that, theoretically that amount wouldn't be needed at all from that point. That'd be correct. Anything else? Council? No. Any other comments? Okay. Um, Right, we'll move on to your, your other topic, Councillor Hopkins. Oh, well, yeah, um, the other, uh, I, I do have one question relating to the actual content of the annual plan, but, but because we've got to get out of this um, convene item and into that one, if, if you'll allow me, I'll just stay with page 28 at the moment. And I'm not sure if this is a, a question or a comment, really, but un, in the um, second heading, confirmed items held over from workshop 16 May, there's a reference there to seal all of or east and western ends of district road at a minimum uh, bracket internal loan. It does say no action, but at the meeting on, I think of the 30th, it was agreed that the mayor suggested I raise the matter of possibly implementing our policy to seal a portion of that road or perhaps using dust suppression trials on district road and settlement road. And the mayor asked me to liaise with the um, Submitter and the roading manager, which I have done, and the matter is under consideration from the roading department at the moment. So our office, is, our office is willing to accept that there's a little bit different from no action. That's correct, and and that has been minuted and recognised. Simply, they've put no action from a financial perspective at this time. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, it's just basically application of an existing policy rather than changing yeah. anything. So. Um, right, anything else? It, 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 got something? Has anyone got anything on parking? Sorry, no, that's fine. Um, so we'll move to Councillor Holding and then Deputy Mayor and then Councillor McCone. So just a clarification on Jim's point, and then just below in the next box, the box is that a different settlement road approved no impact? Oh, sorry, no, take that back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. May I ask my question on from the, from the content? This is not a typo or anything on the in the annual plan itself. The document that we've received as a as an appendix. Is it possible to ask that question now, please? Um, okay. On page, I'm just. It, it may relate to the. Um, issue brought up in the public forum this morning. I'm just curious to know why if you, on page 72, we've got a whole lot of rate increases um, and uh, examples. And most of them 
uh, there's one or two um, exceptions, but most of them, if there is a percentage increase, it's each of the percentage increases in different areas is more or less similar to the others. But I'm just curious, at the bottom of the page, the agricultural properties, can any officer shed light on why there are such significant discrepancies in the percentage increase of some of those agricultural properties in Hariri, Papakaya, Waitaki Bridge? Um, it, it just puzzles me. Is there any is there any explanation for that that we have? I, one, one, one would have thought that the pattern of consistency evident elsewhere should have been apparent there as well. So I'm just curious to know why it's not. Um, probably the simple answer is really the, the raise, issue that was raised in the public forum. It is the interaction between uh, the land value and the capital value rate and how that, uh, the, the mix of individual properties uh, and also the, the difference in between the wards, you know, so that uh, some of the wards rate, ward rates also moved in sort of a uh, different amount across the time. So, um, you know, the, uh, the agricultural properties really did not receive the benefit of holding the water and, you know, the water and sewer rates at the level, um, you know, so the, that decision you know, it had a cushioning impact primarily in the urban areas and far less of an impact in the rural areas. So you know, we do have a complex rating system that uh, the various rates into each, interact with each other in uh, strange and interesting ways at times. So I, I think the thing about this is, that, you know, we that there hasn't been any direct targeting of any sector no. over another. It's what decisions that are made around... What, what are the things that uh, we need to do or, or, you know, we want to do or the community wants us to do and how are they funded? Um, and then also looking at, okay, where can we make some savings? And as Mr Hope's referred to, there's been some savings made in some of the water activities and so on, which um, particularly wastewater, I mean, farms aren't, aren't on wastewater systems, so they don't get any benefit of, of any saving there. Um, whereas in most residential properties do. So it's yeah. it's where it falls. And um, obviously there's some things happened uh, in some of those communities um, that uh, impacted those ones, those farming properties more than some other farming properties and other communities. So um, I'm not sure whether Mr Hope can actually say what were the activities that we increased no, sure. Look, look it, wasn't, it wasn't a witch hunt. I, no, no, no. Just I'm just trying to make page. sure we explain that yeah. as, as well as possible um, because I you know, have heard, heard from farmers that why, why are you penalising us? It's a, simply what have what have been the things that we, you know, had to, the prices have gone up on or we're doing more of or whatever it is that those costs have fallen on the general rate mm -hmm. um, as opposed to other costs such as water and soil where we've made savings, but they're on a on an individual property basis. Um, and some of those, as I say, don't affect farms at all. So yeah, it's it's a bit bit challenging. It would be good to get a better understanding of what those particular items in the general rate have been, but, uh, what the changes have been. Um, okay, anything uh, else? So Deputy Mayor Halalele. My question is in regards to recommendation number two. Sorry, flicking between documents here. So, what's that one? Um, just a question. Um, so, either chair, um, over to Ms. McIntosh or Mr. Hope. Are you able to remind me about the um, annual activities cost for the library and the aquatic centre, please? And then, subsequent to that, if we were to go to a $15 million loan, for the event centre, what would the comparison be for that? Uh, yeah, no, I can answer that. So, um, so the aquatic centre has an annual total expenditure of uh, just over one point seven million dollars. Uh, requires rate funding of just over a million dollars. The library is two point one million dollars. Uh, and has uh, requires rates funding of 1.7 million. So, uh, in terms of you know, 
again, was raised probably in the public forum, and I, yeah, it hasn't been kept secret. It, it is going to depend a lot on the facility that we're looking at. But you know, that is certainly in line with I think, the expected operating costs of the event centre. Uh, and although the, you know, the, the the difference between a $10 million contribution and a $15 million contribution, um, yeah, that is significant. But in terms of an annualised cost, uh, you'd still end up in the ballpark of those two facilities. And, you know, and I suppose why they're relevant, they are the two, by, by far the two most visited and used facilities that Council provides. So, um, what, yeah, you, what did you one again? Yeah. Uh, so, 1.7 million. Yeah. But, you know, we receive, um, you know, it requires a million dollars in rates. So, you know, it, is, it does generate significant user charges that help. Uh, fund the cost of that activity. Yes, I'll well, so I know I was doing some of that maths last night out of curiosity, and I think I figured out the 15 million between the 13,000 is a one off $115 cost per household. And if we only take, take a million dollars across the 13,000 rate payers, probably $70 a year. Rough blunt instrument, but I was curious as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things we need to do is look at what the impact is on an individual household basis and we need to actually determine how is that shared or best shared um, between uh, people in different areas because the further away you are the less likely you are able to, to use the new facility. Um, as, as we get into the discussion uh, on the event centre, um, firstly I think you know we've and I, I know uh, most of us are, are very committed to, to making sure that everything is done to, to make this project happen. Um, it's going to be very difficult if it doesn't happen this time for it to, to ever be raised again or for in the foreseeable future. And that's definitely a challenge. Um, thankfully, the construction cost inflation is dropping off. And in some cases, um, some, some products and so on are going backwards, so uh, they're, they're dropping in price because they had been pretty inflated uh, with some of the shortages and so on that we had. So there's definitely some some benefits there. Um, I think the Event Centre Trust has got more work to do. Um, they, they've got a couple of or several major funders that they still need to sort out, but um, it's chicken and egg, and those ones want to see the commitment from council. And we need to be considering what that is. We've got um, a lot of people in the community who are obviously very constrained financially at the moment, and we've also got a lot of people in the community who want to see this happen. Um, so that's that's the challenge that we all have in front of us as we try and find the the right um, compromise, if you like, without actually compromising the project. But I think this is a time where we've got to be inventive about how we might be able to do something. Um, I think we're quite happy to, to confirm the $10 million that we've got. It's what happens after that. And there's, you know, looking at the funding sources, um, previously we'd committed um, up to a million dollars from the RMA uh, Reserves Fund. There's a bit over $2 million sitting in there now. We can put that fund into deficit and look at um, reprioritizing some of the some of the commitments from that, the allocations that come out of that, and decide is the event centre uh, such a big project that actually it needs to take priority and we need to make some hard calls on that. Um, we can't do that at this meeting because it's a bit more involved than just saying that's what we're going to do. Um, whether we give more money than that, um, then um, say the three million that could come out of that uh, really depends, I think, on whether we can find other non-rate sources of funding. And um, we don't have an Auckland, uh, Auckland Airport shares to sell um, because we're not Auckland City Council, nor are we Michael Wood, so we won't go there. Um, but we do need to look at what what priorities we do make around the um, you know prioritising the event centre. So 
uh, had a, a quick chat with uh, Mr. Palmley, and we, we do have a possible um, a motion that uh, we can we can bring forward. But I'd like us to just have a discussion around what the feeling is around here, around support for the event centre um, overall, but also about the, uh, the yeah what. What, what do you think around the finances, particularly if we can make it from non-rate sources? So, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, <clears throat> we tend to, when we sit around this um, table, focus and question a lot on costs. Um, I think this is an opportunity to focus on investment. Um, we're investing in the future of our young people. We're investing in the future of um, the town. Um, I know firsthand from my involvement with a, a junior tournament that is shared around the South Island. Um, and if it's an Invercargill or Nelson, um, there might be 24, 25 teams. If it's in the centre of the island, it's 30 to 32 teams. So that's the sort of payback that we would have if we have a facility. Um, and I don't think this is a question of um, should we or shouldn't we. Uh, the question should be how do we make it happen? Um, and so I'm 100% in favour of us assisting. Um, and we must bear in mind that central government funding agencies have come back and said that the community must step up to the plate. Now, some individuals are, and hopefully more will. Um, the challenge for us is how we can support it, uh, achieve equity for our community, because the sad thing is some of the families who are going to benefit most with this facility are also the ones who are going to struggle to actually pay extra costs. Um, but in principle, I'm 100% behind us supporting the stadium. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Halalele. Yeah, thank you through the Chair. Um, I myself in agreement with Councillor Thompson. I'm wholeheartedly supportive and I would be advocating for going for the 15 million contribution uh, from Council. Um, the question that uh, Councillor Thompson asked was, uh, how do we make this happen? My question is, what is it going to take to make this happen? Um, I think um, in response to a lot of the submissions that were Put through 50% uh, were in support of, of the 15 million that was um, put out to the community, um, just in support of a lot of families that would be um, supportive of this. I know that a number of families in Waitaki travel um, every weekend to go and take their children to those other places, um, Goa, Invercargill, Dunedin, Tomaru, Christchurch, um, all the way up to North Island if they need to, to support their children's um, sporting activities. I know that there is a South Island netball tournament next week in Christchurch, and if there are 50 students that are going, 500 each, that equates to about 25,000 whereas we could offer that opportunity here uh, in our community. So I understand, you know, like the challenges in terms of cost, but also want to advocate for the well-being of the community. So I am advocating for the higher end of it. I think we can nut out some other uh, opportunities in terms of how we construct um, the contribution from council. Also want to acknowledge the trust, uh, the fundraising trust and the work that they are doing uh, as well, and we know that they need to be doing more work uh, in that space to help advocate, but they also need to um, have that backing from council because lotteries and um, other philanthropy trusts won't be able to put in. It'll make it a lot harder for them to contribute to the overall cost if um, we're sitting at the contribution that we're sitting now. So I'm I'm very supportive of the 15 million that's been, um, that could be the opportunity. The trust actually requested 18 million. So if you want to go that high, we can even take it up another three. We don't want to do all their work for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Linwood. Uh, I just want to echo my support for uh, Hannah's comments. I would be supportive of the 15 million as well. And I do think we need to be courageous. Um, the benefits for the community, in my mind, really do outweigh the negatives. So, yeah. Um, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah. Um, I think your point at the start was um, 
that we needed to be inventive. Um, and in my view, the other thing we have to be is strategic. Um, well, actually, there are two other things we have to be. We need to be inventive. We also need to be persuasive. Um, we need to persuade the community that if they want some of these things, um, and 50% do, but at the moment, 50% don't. Um, I'm not saying the other 50% are united in a common view because they're not. They either don't want to have anything to do with the centre at all, or they want to cap, cap funding at 50, um, 10 million, or they don't know. So it's not as though it's a, 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 an absolutely equivalent split. But um, the, the, the thing that scares the scares me fundamentally is um, the, 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 the what the future we confront in terms of chosen costs, the things we want to do, and imposed costs, the things we're told we have to do. Now, we had a, we, we've just seen, and I've raised this matter before, um, we've just seen government propose a new waste management um, uh, formula that they're going to force on councils nationwide that will add um, probably about 3 million to the rates annually, um, which is the equivalent of what we're currently spending on the library and the aquatic centre, according to the information Paul's given us this morning. Um, the thing that worries me about the, about the um, uh, sports and events centre uh, is the ongoing operational costs. And I wish we had done, and I still hope we can do more to look at ways to generate income from the centre rather than simply impose costs on ratepayers. Having said that, I think your view that we might go to 15 million subject to some of that coming from sources other than rates is one that I would support. But what we have to do is say to the community quite clearly, we need to start finding other ways to pay for things. And that means possibly shedding un underperforming assets and, um, uh, uh, and um, council uh, uh, property, if you wish, um, in exchange for things that we think will do more and achieve more. And um, uh, in my view, that's the only sustainable way we can do this in the future. Uh, but, you know, we've only got 13,000 ratepayers and the annual plan says there's going to be 110 more, 112 more estimated over the, the period of the long-term plan, I think. Um, we're asking these people to pay an awful lot of money for an awful lot of things. And we have to persuade the community, if they're worried about the cost of rates and affordability, they have to accept the need to look to other ways to do things. And this is an opportunity to do that, in my view. In fact, it's not an opportunity, it's an obligation. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, well, I, I think what do at the moment is, is read out the wording we've got in front of me. Um, um, I, okay, well, once Councillor Blackler has spoken, uh, what I'm going to do is read out the wording that I've got here and um, we won't vote on it straight away. We will work our way through things, but that would, if, if there's general agreement, um, that will be part of um, the decisions that we do make. So we'll go to Councillor Blackler and then Councillor Ryan. Thanks, Mayor Kircher. I, I just had a question um, perhaps for Mr Hope around um, the medium to long-term debt profile for Council uh, now that we've made recent amendments and there's been the changes to the waters um, reform and the, and the timeline and stuff like that um, around uh, the, the time of Council entering into a a position of being a net borrower and um what you know what that time frame now looks like um and the and the impact that that will have on rate payers and second to that what would i would i be correct in assuming that if we do um overdraw the rma reserves uh, we, we would essentially still be um taking out a loan to achieve that Uh, second question first. Yeah, so if yeah, if we overdrew the 
the RMO fund, like any reserve, yes, it would be treated as a loan, uh, but, but essentially it would be charged interest. Um, and then but that interest would be funded from subsequent contributions rather than rather than from rates directly. So uh, it, it is a it is a commitment of a funding source going forward. So um, but it would be borrowed externally. Uh, yeah, it certainly would be. The, uh, yeah, just just, to just so the contributions are when when subdivision happens and, and a subdivider pays. So essentially for uh, until that debt was paid off, it would be that subdivision activity pays for it. It's not rate payers paying for it, um, which was, you know, is, is important. So, I mean, we've, we've got a lot of debt sitting um, there, both internally and externally, which is um, a lot paid through rates, uh, repaid through rates. There's some that is, is repaid through other things. So we've got a lot, we've got debt for overbuilds and some of our water infrastructure, which gets paid for through development contributions. So, it's understanding that um, yeah, it's not debt isn't all paid for by rates. There's other in, uh, inputs in there, and in this RMA reserves fund case, that definitely is the subdivision activity. Just hope did you have something new? Um, yeah, in terms of the first question, sorry, I can't really answer that question. We haven't reforecast re um, the sort of the the debt profile since the particularly since the announcement of the extension of three waters. So the last one we did was looking at um, essentially all of the three waters debt being transferred uh, in 24. Uh, so we haven't recast that for the next two years or after the revised spending profile that came through from the waters team. Um, both the, you know, acknowledge you sort of asked this question, I didn't give much of an answer um, on the email, but I will repeat it. It's like, I would have thought, you know, an additional four or $5 million of debt you know, would would cause council to be a net borrower for probably a, a three to four year period, given our level of repayments um, that we uh, that we undertake on an annual basis for the balance of that debt. Councillor Ryan. Uh, thank you. So I just wanted to add my voice in support of um, us investing an extra five million dollars. Um, it's an opportunity for us to showcase our dedication to the future of this district and our willingness to make brave decisions um we'll, we'll be left behind if we don't um if we don't invest extra or if we build to reduce scope um and just one thing that i sort of wanted to highlight was the cost to our district if we don't um yeah as sort of has been outlined our athletes are facing massive travel costs to participate in sporting events um as sports clubs are struggling to grow um, we're losing young people and families to other centres that have the facilities to help them excel in these sports, and we're losing opportunities to attract events that we could have here. Um, I think our district and our people are worth this investment. Thank you very much. So um, the wording um, when we do, when it does come time to move it, um, it will replace us number two in the recommendations, uh, which is about the, agreeing to a level of funding. So two would be, um, two um, A is reaffirms its commitment of $10 million to support the event centre. Two agrees that council is minded to provide up to an additional $5 million in support subject to, and those um, conditions would be a further report to council outlining how this can be funded without adding to future rate increases and an updated fundraising plan from the event centre trust for the remaining funding required and a risk assessment carried out. So, so we won't move those yet. I'm just signalling that's what we will get to when we, as we once we work our way through the rest of uh, any other plan discussions, and then we'll get um, the various things moved at that point. Um, but yeah, certainly take on board comments both for and cautions against um, the situation. It's not an easy thing for us to do, um, but uh, yeah, we wouldn't be, um, we're not here to make easy decisions, I guess. So anyway, we'll get on with, um, so, oh, Councillor Blacker, you have further questions? We're going to the appropriate time, but we're not going to go yet. Thank you. Okay, right. So anything else in the annual plan? There's a few other things. Oh. Deputy Mayor Hal Daly. No, no. We'll, um, 
Councillor Holding. Well, just to comment, I think it's probably it's not palatable anyway amongst this discussion of raising cost challenges, but it is the second year in the row that we're delivering a lower rate increase than in the annual plan, which I think will echo this year's uh, comments from the auditor that doing it once is pretty remarkable and twice is probably unheard of. So even though we are facing quite significant challenges and looking at big spending, we actually have done quite well, I think. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I said, people probably won't agree, and it's never that powerful, especially on the time at the moment that we're all in. But it's best of a bad situation. Okay. Are there any other um, comments in there? I'll just probably mention the information centre because it's been a cause of consternation along the way. Um, we've obviously improved the the situation from what it was and i just want to acknowledge the work that's been done there um but it, 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 it i think it does uh, really emphasize the need to do a, a better study economic study of the you know what the white sense of trust provides and um the benefits and uh you know that that, that aren't necessarily financial but then there are definitely financial ones which they they don't directly benefit from but the community does so um that's something i do want us to see us do um i don't think it should wait for um an economic development agency necessary to be set up to do that but uh if we've got um got the ability to uh, engage some experienced people who to do that um, economic analysis that would be very helpful I think to all of us sitting around this table as we make decisions on what happens in that particular area of the district um any other comments from anyone if I me Kutcher, I just want to um make an um recognition on page 72 which was the changes to rates examples that we looked at earlier when Councillor Hopkins referred to that page and I just wanted to let you know that this um, paper was just it omitted in the inclusion for the Mahino um, example there we've now had to show a water charge of $710 which is as a result of them joining the Omaru Maraki supply and that's not reflected in those figures so there will be a change to that Mahino um, example there so I just wanted to let that be known. So the um, just just a quick question on that I did have, which was um, with was the Mahino supply was it included in seven point nine five percent? Yes, it was. Okay, because I I think that's an important uh, aspect is that you know this is this is essentially new money coming in. This is a new activity that we are doing that we weren't doing before. The community or that part of the community was paying for a service before privately um so you know when, when people talk about what their increase is going to be that's not part of of that it's um specific to an area and it's um it, it's a, a rate that wasn't being made before but it is in response to requests from that community that we take over that service council hopkins um just sorry just Clarify, um, I think we went out for consultation with a with a proposal that um, I'm trying to remember the exact wording, um, uh, uh, Mandy, um, but it related to what the impact would be for people in Mahino and uh, elsewhere for the, at least for the first year. Um, does the number you've just given us change that, or is that simply a, um, an expression of what that actually? In, in real dollar terms, what that said in the annual plan consultation document. Exactly that. So all, all, it, all it is is in that in that example line in that table, we need to adjust the Mahino line for the water rate being added uh, to the property. Right. Okay. Any nothing else? Right, if we go to the recommendation this then, um, and I've, we'll take these separately and uh, have any discussions on them. So, um, first of all, there's the uh, number one, which is council confirms the following minor matters that support the uh, resolution A, confirm the parking fees effective from 1st of July 2023 and the discontinuation. Of the free parking period from 1st of October 2023. Um, 
I'll move that with whoever second it, Deputy Mayor Halalele. Just very quickly speaking to that. So it, it, we've, we've talked about this um, quite a bit now. This continuation of free parking period from 1st of October, that's in anticipation of having done the, the review of things by then and having a, it may not, it, 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 may, well, it may be just that we stop free parking and it's back to the way it was, um, or it may be that we've got a new system to put into place or, or um, that we uh, basically will work on to get in place. And I'm not too sure how long that might actually take um, if it requires, whether it's new machines or uh, different machines or whether it's uh, new signage that has to go up and um, new processes set up. So we'll work our way through that. Um, so any further discussion on that, number one? Okay, I'll put that. Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? It's carried. Number two is the um, motion on the event centre. Um, so government supervisors putting that up at the moment. Um, so it'll be two A and B, will it? Two. So, so it's two, one, two, 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 two A. Two. Okay, fine. <laughs> right. So I'll give you a moment just to absorb that. I'm happy to second that, Mayor Kitchen. Oh, sorry. Doesn't mean no um, So, mover for that. Yeah. Deputy Mayor and Secretary yeah. Councillor Hopkins. So, <clears throat> speaking to that, Deputy Mayor Halalele. I do have some caution in terms of um, a further report to council. Um, what I don't want is the trust um, being limited in terms of what they can put forward to potential funders if we're putting too many fish hooks. So that's just one kind of caution just from, from my perspective. I completely understand with the um, comprehensive fundraising plan that's, that it should be as a must um, as well. Um, and then commitment of significant funding being secured? No, definitely. I just don't want us to be a hindrance if we are too detailed in terms of the the uh, the motions that we're going to be agreeing to. I'm not sure. I would prefer keeping things as simple as possible, and then we can undertake some of the ABC behind um, and allow the council staff to work in collaboration with the project board and the uh, fundraising trust to try and fulfill uh, those other um, sections of, of that motion. But I'm fully in support of the 15 million. We need to. Um, some of the themes that came out through the submissions in favour um, of it is a, there is a sense of urgency uh, with the event centre being built. The district needs a multi use, fit for purpose facility that can host a range of sporting events and cultural events and other conferences and things that would help. Uh, increase the economic benefit for the whole district. Uh, it also achieves our overall strategic um, priorities and community outcomes. And we also need to be uh, future focused and focusing on investing in our in the younger um, generation of this district. Um, one thing that is of mind, um, this week is Waitaki Week. And for those that don't know what Waitaki Week is, then you need to kind of uh, get out there and engage with our younger members of our community. It's when the three high schools uh, have an annual competition within inter-schools, uh, different sports. And that's happening this week. And I know that the rec centre was packed. St Kevin's gym will be packed. There won't be any room for parents, most likely, at some of the events. So these are some of the things that I would be urging um, our team to consider uh, in terms of just being future focused and what kind of legacy do you want to leave? What is it going to take to make sure that we ensure um, that we future proof? And it's probably going to be a bit too late for my children that are at high school um, to reap the benefits of having their inter schools and sports things here. But it's not too late for Councillor Blackler and uh, Councillor Lynn was there. Um, so, no, I'm supportive of that. I do urge you just to be mindful um, of any unintended uh, consequences of just the additional A, B and C. Those are things that we can actively um, uh, consider. Um, but I would prefer that we do keep a, a nice, clear cut, tidy uh, motion just to make things as easy as possible, accessible as possible uh, for the fundraising trust to get out there and do the rest of their job. They need to kind of help finish this off um, for us and make sure that we get this built within uh, this decade would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you.
Good comments. Stand at Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, I, I can understand the, the Deputy Mayor's concern regarding, um, you know, uh, additional complexities and so on. However, um, the it, I'm quite comfortable with the fact that the, the report would simply be a report to us telling us how we could actually find $5 million without necessarily adding $5 million to the, to the bill that ratepayers have to pick up. Now, so that's, that's, I can't see how that would make it, make, make things more problematic for other people. What I can see is that um, there is com concern in the community. 25% of all the people who submitted on the matter said, get out, don't have anything to do with it, drop it altogether. So there is a, um, a minority, but a significant minority of people who are uncomfortable or anxious about the cost and the potential impact um, that it may have. Uh, We've said that we would like to add, we're, we're agreeing, we're minded to provide an additional 5 million, but we would prefer it to come from sources other than rates. So all A to, um, uh, 2 to A is going to do is give us some options as to how we could do that. And the community needs to know that as well. I mean, one way or the other, they will end up paying or, or carrying that cost. Um, so, I mean, if... We've, we've heard about transparency and claims that we're not transparent enough. Well, this is a, a classic example of where not only we can be transparent, but where we have to be transparent. We have to engage the community in a conversation about how it funds its, its desires and its wishes and its needs. And this is, a, this is the opportunity to begin that conversation, in my view. So I'm, I'm not unduly troubled by a... Thank you. Councillor Ryan. Thank you. I um, just wanted to echo Deputy Mayor Halalele's comments, and I do share some of the concerns around the complexity of A. Um, I think we need to sort of send a, a strong message to the community that we are confident in this facility, and if we're wanting to attract more, um, you know, or support those who have already funded and potential future funders, we need to really send a clear, confident message to the community. Um, Yeah, uh, and just as for an example, on uh, on Saturday, uh, netball was once again cancelled. Um, we had rain um, overnight and the courts were not playable. Um, as a result, talked to lots of people on the ground um, about the future of the stadium. They really want a clear message from the council. They really want confidence that it's going to happen. Um, and, yeah, i just like to see us do that. Thank you for that, and yeah, totally support that. I mean, this, this is to send a message that we are committed to making it happen. Um, you know, we've certainly got reasonable ideas about how we can make sure that we don't add more costs onto rates um, over and above the ten million dollars. And uh, I'm confident we can make that happen. It is an investment, and we need to see it as that is going to provide services and so on. We just we haven't had in the past or we've had to travel to go and use other people's and um great example you know uh, from councillor ryan on, on the netball situation and you know we just need to make sure that uh, our community stays active they, that they are able to participate and um, are able to achieve high standards of participation and and commitment um in, in their chosen activities we also need that venue that will um, be able to host a large gathering for, for formal dinners or, or various other activities and, um, and events and make it as multi-use as possible. Um, I do want to you know, really um, emphasise the, the importance that this is to our young people as they, as they grow up and as they develop in their sports and, and activities. Um, this isn't you know, isn't just for the, the people who are going to be paying for it. It's going to be for their, hopefully their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. Um, it's it's going to be something that is there for a good long time and it's going to continue, you know, provide a, a level of service which is, is um, really necessary in today's world. Um, I do want to also send the, the message to the Event Centre Trust that they absolutely have to get on with their fundraising, which it's critical that we get every cent we possibly can from elsewhere. Uh, every every extra cent that they gain um, is perhaps a cent less that we have to uh, find ourselves. Um, 
So we need them to be making sure that they look under every stone, that they look under every cushion on every couch, find whatever they can um, and, and make the most of it. And again, if there is anything we can do to help, we are here willing and ready. Um, I think the support for the community long term is, you know, it's, it's important. There is an economic benefit to this, which people will move here when we've got this type of facility. They will make decisions on if they've got uh, flexibility on on jobs and so forth. If, if they've got this type of facility, it's another reason why they can move to um, Omru and the Waitaki district and be part of our community and hopefully share on the cost. Um, so, yeah, very, very much support this. Um, we need to be brave. We need to be um, thinking pretty laterally on what we're, how we fund this and how we make sure that our community can afford not just the capital cost, but also the operating costs into the future. Um, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just to uh, endorse your comments about uh, an economic benefit to the district. Um, for the benefit of um, new councillors, we heard in the last triennium that the specific example of where staff were recruited for a role um, here in Omru, and then when they came to visit, they rejected the job offer because they considered that the sports facilities weren't up to their kids and they chose a role in a larger centre. So there definitely is um, a, a twofold effect um, in this investment in our future. Thank you. Councillor McCone. Yeah, look, I think I, I, I agree pretty much with everything that's been said here today. I think we've got to be proactive for the town and look at the future. It is a cost and how we do that cost. Uh, a concerns me a little bit in the report that yes, we need to know what's going on, but also will it constrain the trust, considering the, the time of the year we're at, where funding funding entities are starting a new financial year, are we constraining their time frame to actually go and apply for that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I just like to change the wording on A, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. Um. I don't think, I mean, basically we're agreeing to 15. We just, we need the extra information about how we're going to fund it. So it's not going to hold anything up. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been going on in the background around applications being um, made uh, or at least um, written. Uh, I, I believe there's been ongoing conversations with likes of lotteries and the community trust and others to, um, to make sure that there's an understanding of, of what can be committed uh, by those organisations. And you know, we absolutely need them to get out and make sure they do that. Any other comments? Yeah. Councillor Percival and then Councillor Holding. Yeah, through the Chair. Um, there can't be anything happen. But there can't be a spade in the ground until there's full funding full costs, that's across the board, that's the construction, the groundwork, a walk-in, walk-out stadium or event centre. What concerns me is that even with the contingencies in the tenders that we received and seen, which doesn't include all the groundwork anyway, if, if the spade does go in the ground, and, and I don't think it's naive, it's naive to think that there won't be overruns, for sure. So where will they come, Retrust, come back for more funding? That will come back to us. That's my concern, and I do share Jim's concern with the operational costs also having an effect. But I mean, I agree with everything that's been said today, but I do have this grave concern about getting the thing finished without them coming back to us for more funding. So I think the, the answer to that is the fact that, you know, yeah. the building contract, um, we're looking at, basically the project group has been looking at $26 million for that. Um, overall, we're looking at $32 million. Now, $3 million of that is going to be for things like, you know, the fit out, you know, the, they build a building, but you've still got to 
make sure that the courts are all set up, that you've got, you know, basketball hoops or netball hoops or nets or whatever, all of the equipment needs to be um, needs to be purchased, so it pays for that. Um, there's to be a sealed car park outside and other landscaping, so it's, um, there's, it's got to pay for that. But there's also $3 million contingency uh, within the $32 million, and that is hopefully going to be used very stringently and might not all be, need to be used. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, but, yeah, that, that relies on a lot of uh, real fiscal responsibility um, on the, the project management side of things. Uh, that it's it's there if it's needed, but it's if it's not needed, then um, it doesn't get used. Do you have that? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Just uh, seek leave to amend um, section two. Agrees that council provides an additional five million in support, subject to ABC, and to a request to remove is minded to. Yep, I think that reflects the intention. And it's your motion, so yes. <laughs> so so, we, so we, we're dropping the words in mind. Council. Thank you. Okay, um, other, other speakers. So we'll go to Council Blackler and then Councillor Charles. Uh, I just, I just said a, a a, a comment about a possible amendment as well around um, in 2A without adding to future and voluntary rate increases. Um, I just think it opens um, the floor to what kind of initiatives that we could come up with possibly. Um, as in contributions that could be made, but then with a voluntary deduction um, via Yes, my, my understanding from talking to officers is that we are able to facilitate um, targeted um, rates on a voluntary basis for, you know, the, the example used was for um, stop crossings on roads. Mm. Um, so it just opens us up to exploring <laughs> another possible way of facilitating. Yeah, I'd seek officer comment on that. I mean, it's not, it, I think if that was to become a possibility, we couldn't, could agree to it at that point. Yeah. But, um, Mr. Hope, do you have any comment on that? I, I suppose the, the way I would interpret it, it is only a report. Mm -hmm. So we're just presenting options. Council can then take it in any direction it wants to when it actually comes to making a decision. So it is only a report about funding options. Uh, it, it's, it, it is not committing council to any future direction. It is merely receiving a report as to option, uh, alternate funding options. But, yeah, but if it doesn't say involuntary rate, if it says no rate increase at all, then a possible involunt involuntary scenario wouldn't, by definition, be presented. I, I think that could be just an addendum to the or part of the report that, hey, you know, here's all the things that we can do without adding to rates, but here's a way of fundraising that, yes, it would add to rates. But, you know, council can agree to that at that point, rather than rather than muddying the waters and it being picked up wrongly by parts of the community um, and just keep it cleaner at the moment for for that but yeah to, it, it would be a good fundraising opportunity um, to do it that way but yeah Could we to speak to yeah, yeah thank you um i i'm hearing uh what all what all my um colleagues are uh, saying this morning around thinking to the future and thinking for our, our next generation and so forth. And um, as many of you are aware, my my children are the ones to benefit from such an initiative. But um, I, I feel incredibly uncomfortable about the timing of this project with respect to um, where, where everything's at, both um, internally and um, externally, uh, so yeah. I mean, I'm I'm pleased to see this um, alternative um, proposal put forward here. I think 
sometimes you have to follow your gut. And for me personally, at, at, a, at, a, um, at a minimum, I, I'm, I'm feeling comfortable with 10 million based on the, the feedback that we've received from the community. But I, I agree that we need um, we need to kind of think laterally around how we achieve this this additional five million for for our community. Thank you. Try to reply. Oh, sorry. No, I've got um, Councillor Cowles and then Councillor Holding. And then write a reply. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, look, I'd just like to echo uh, most of what's been said through uh, the room today. I think, you know, we need to look into the future. I agree that, um, you know, th these sorts of facilities need to um, be looked at. Um, it does make me a lot more comfortable that we're going to find, you know, try and find that five million, or or, or, or find it without affecting rates. It is a tough time for for a lot of people at the moment. I think that sort of eases some of uh, my previous concerns. But um, this needs to go ahead. Uh, we we need to keep looking forward, um, and I think that as other people said, the lateral thinking, the the, the creative ways that we can look at stuff. Um, but as uh, Councillor Hopkins said um, it may mean that we have to look at some other services that are not performing or other other assets. Um, you know, nothing comes for free. Councillor Holden. Okay, I'll, I'll be supporting the motion on the board. I think I said that I know the circumstances and any other circumstances, the timing is a bit trickier, but um, I want to see a clear signal that I want that. Uh, Project completed properly. Don't want it to be under undercooked. So I'd be supporting the fifty million dollars that we get on and deliver something that's fit for purpose, uh, fit for purpose for the community for the future. Okay, Councillor Longwood. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm supportive of the motion as well. I think it is going to bring a lot of benefits to the community, and I think uh, Deputy Mayor Halalale summed it up perfectly. Yeah, and right reply, Deputy Mayor. Uh, no, thank you. Just fully, really, you know, like um, supportive of, of what we are trying to achieve. Um, our vision and our mission is to empower our people in place to thrive. And we do want Waitaki to be the best place um, to be. We do want the opportunity to be part of the circuits when there are sporting regional sporting opportunities that our local families don't have to fork out hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have to travel to. Um, and we just want to ensure that there are opportunities here for our own community uh, to be able to take part in that. I completely understand Councillor Blackler's uh, concerns and his level of comfort uh, in this. The other option is the fundraising trust can give all that money back that they've already fundraised for. Um, and that's some of the, um, the hearsay that has been discussed within them. A lot of other local businesses are really wanting to invest, but they wanted a level of insurance that we're going to go ahead. Um, that we are not um, afraid of a new challenge, that we're not afraid to be able to invest in the future of our community. Uh, and I think that the uh, fundraising trust will find it a lot more easier to go out to those bigger funders um, with the, um, if they have the backing of, of council with the additional five million. I am still cautious about A, um, but if that's the consensus of the team, then that is fine. Um, so long as we give um, some additional support to the trust to help them with their fundraising activities, um, because I know that there would, should be um, some more partnerships there that we can help support them with some events to help fundraise uh, to top up the amount that is needed. Uh, so, um, that is all I have to say. If anyone wants to watch uh, Waitaki Inter School, St. Kevin's versus Waitaki Girls uh, this afternoon, St. Kevin's. Um, there won't be room, probably, because we don't have a big enough of an event centre to stand in. Um, so hopefully at least one mum will be able to fit within there. So thank you. That's the um, intermediate grade. Uh, it's 4.30 p.m. Okay. Um, but it's morning tea time, so we might um, vote afterwards. No, I'm having you on. Um, <laughs> we'll have the vote now uh, and, and then go to morning tea. So um, those in favour of two, uh, as written there, uh, please say aye. Aye. And those against? That's carried. And yeah, it's good. It's I think we're very straight for uh, now and not controversial. Noted unanimously. Thank you. Um, 
No, we're, we're 12 minutes late, so we might as well go, go and not be quite um, as late as we would be if we carried on. I, I just do want to note, just on that last item, um, we we need to be a bit imaginative about how we um, fund the, the repayments and so forth of whatever loan we take out. We know we're in a, a relatively high interest rate um, period at the moment, but we also have good assurances from uh, right around the world that that is a, a two or three year uh, high. And looking at the possibility of um, changing, you know, modifying a, a, a loan repayment period, um, looking at whether initially it may be a, a, a capped amount, which pays the interest in a wee bit of principal. And then when interest rates go down, we'll start paying off more of that principal, looking at some of those options to how we smooth rates and make it more affordable to households is going to be important. Um, we don't want to have the loan sitting there forever, but we need to think about the, the beneficiaries over the lifetime of the facility and how they all contribute, not just today's uh, generation. So that's just some further thoughts on that one. With that, we'll uh, um, adjourn and have morning tea. And if we can be back at uh, 5 to 11, please. Thank you.
And welcome back, everybody. Um, so we've still got um, a fair bit to get through. We've got um, our CCOs uh, turning up, so we've got two waiting in the wings um, for the discussion on the um, uh, uh, where are we? Statements of intent. Yes. Um, so anyway, we've we've still got a couple of items uh, left on the this particular paper. So number three. Um, Pretty minor thing, just adopting the uh, annual plan. And we're... Councillor Hopkins is moving that. Councillor Linwood seconding that. Thank you. Any discussion? We've probably had a fair bit of talk on it. No discussion? Sorry. Ms. McIntosh. Sorry, thank you, Mikucha. I, I just wanted to note that uh, a couple of the options that have been presented in the annual plan, I will just review to, to reflect the discussions that we've just had. And then once that has been amended, I'll then pass that to uh, Mr. Palmley and Mikucha just to confirm those changes. That all okay. affect pages, the introduction, as well as pages um, 16 and 19. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'll put it those in favour. We adopt the annual plan. Say aye. Aye. And against. Also unanimous. <laughs> um, and number four, delegating authority to, um, to the chief executive in consultation with myself to make any minor changes. Uh, moved, Councillor Hopkins. Seconded, Councillor Cowles. Thank you. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that is carried. Um, if we can just get through to the... Um, rates. Rates. Um, I'm sorry, I'm finding the page on that one. Um, so the resolution to set the rates is on page uh, 29. Um, not, as is pointed out, not a lot of choice at this stage. Um, there's obviously a lot of work that's gone into this and over, over time. So uh, as I'm happy to move from the chair that um, we adopt that uh, setting of rates and seconded Councillor Linwood. Thank you. Uh, those in favour, please say aye. And against, that is carried. Um, right, we will go now to item 6.6, .6, which is the Council Control Organisation's final statements of intent. And we just will. Um, Apologies to members of uh, staff who are here for the other other items. We will um, work our way through a timetable, and we'll see how we go. But it's probably going to be around eleven thirty at least before we get to the others. So, if um, so members of staff want to come back at that time, um, you'd be very welcome to do to duck away and. Do something else in the meantime. Um, so we've got uh, Whitestone contracting in the wing somewhere, hopefully coming through. So councillors, item 6.6 .6 on page 56. Um, and we'll get Mr Hope just to make comments on this item. Brief comments. Um, thank you. Yep. So, probably just a comment that will apply to all the statements of intent. Uh, it's a statutory process. Uh, we have considered the draft. Uh, we do need to improve the timing of the letters of expectation. Uh, but overall, uh, I believe those have been uh, reflected in the in the final statements of intent. Uh, and we really just hand over to the representatives of What's Own Contracting Limited. Thank you. And um, just note, we've got CE and uh, Deputy Chair, um, Director. Director. Um, so um, my hand to you, uh, George, first, if you like. Or you got any comments you want to make or we'll go straight to Paul? Well, thanks for the opportunity to present today. George. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present and, and um, we look forward to getting closer and closer to the council and, and um, with Whitestone Contracting. It's certainly good to have the maintenance contract back on board and it's having an effect and I'll get Paul Bissett to talk to that and the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 
Uh, thank you, Gary. And thank you, everyone, for your time this morning. Um, I, I guess I'd start out just by thanking you for the letter of expectation that we received. Um, it's really good to have a, a, a good um, direction from our shareholders to, as to the direction of the company we should be taking. We've incorporated all the point, the key points of the um, letter of expectation into our statement of intent. And I thought what we'd do is just run run through it, not word by word, but just where we've incorporated those objectives. Um, letter of expectation is pretty strong about connecting and using local suppliers and subcontractors. Um, last financial year, we, we we spent a lot of money locally in the community uh, with vehicles and whatnot, and we continue to do the same for this year going forward, um, not to the same extent, uh, but certainly will be a focus of us going forward. Um, our return on open shareholder funds of 8% um, is, a, is a work on. Um, this year, we're aiming for just under five. Um, the year before, last year, we were just under four, so we are improving in that space. Um, strong Waitaki uh, economy. We are supporting the community in the Waitaki with our work. We've got 130 FTEs in the company. Um, we've got 70 of those in the Waitaki. Uh, this time last year, we only had about 48 uh, in the Waitaki out of 88. So we've seen a massive increase in our employment in the Waitaki region, about 64% increase. Um, so there's about 30 FTEs that we've taken on over the past 12 months in the Waitaki region. About 18 of those are associated directly with the road maintenance contract. Um, so there's another 12 of those that are outside of that contract, but are, as an indirect result from additional admin, uh, corporate, um, workshop, uh, supervisor, um, and traffic management, for example. So, so that investment um, is paying off and, and having the work locally is certainly paying dividends for the Waitaki um, region. I um, just want to talk about uh, training as well for uh, supporting the business opportunities, uh, the employment opportunity, sorry, for community in Waitaki. Um, so we've got about 40% of our staff undergoing formal training through our ITOs. So it's quite a chunk when you've got 130 FTEs and 40% of them are, have either um, just gone through or just completed a starting or a, in some form of training. I think that's probably a good a good mix, um, any more than that it starts costing a bit of money. Um, but it's good that we, we train people um, and hopefully they stay on board. Labour is a very... Uh, it's a big challenge, um, as we know. It's not getting any easier, I don't think. Um, I think there's a, with diversity, um, I, I, I can honestly say that I think ET could probably walk in tomorrow with a drain last ticket and get a job with us tomorrow. <laughs> there's, there's no issues there. Uh, we had a girl in high vis um, day last week, which was which was fantastic. We had uh, five young ladies from the Waitaki Girls High School there playing some diggers and some survey gear, and it was a, it was a fantastic day out. Um, safety and, and well-being. Um, currently, we're sitting with a trifle of zero, uh, which is fantastic. Um, our, our target is less than two, so zero is obviously very good. We've done this by um, really working on our culture and our staff engagement. And a lot of that's just around toolbox meetings. For example, we've had 476 toolbox meetings this financial year, uh, whereas last year we had 118 for the whole year. So that's just an example of how we're really engaging with our team and improving our culture and making our workplace safer. We're doing a lot of work around our technology. Uh, we're bringing a lot of our safety um, software into a, into a mobile platform that will allow us to be more visible with our data. Um, with the responsible corporate citizen, we've sort of incorporated that into our mission, which is our team delivers with pride and care. Our pride covers their quality of jobs, well-kept plant, tidy sites, and a good image for the company. Um, and our care covers for care for our people, care for the environment, and care for the communities we operate in. I think with, um, with going forward for next year, um, when you look at the financial side of it, this year our revenue went up about 26 million, um, which is up from last year. We got to about 22. 
uh, our budget for next year is 29 million. So we are slowly working towards that goal of 30 to 35 million that was in the letter of expectation. Um, I think I think key to that is getting work locally. Um, that the work we've got outside of our of, of the Waitaki um, is, is good work, um, but we're stronger in the Waitaki. Um, we've got 14.5 million dollars worth of secured work for next financial year. Um, currently, we've got eight and a half million of that is secured with the Waitaki District Council, which is fantastic. This financial year, this current financial year, we've turned over 26 million. Uh, eight million of that was with the Waitaki District Council. Last year, we turned over 22 million and we did about 3 million. So you can see as the, um, the more we work closer together um, and the more work we get locally, the, the better off we are. So I guess that's that's probably a bit of a high level wrap up um, of it. But look, just thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the comments and the letter of expectation um, around strengthening our, our relationship. I think there's a, some positive stuff to come. So open to questions. Thank you very much. Um, all right, any quick questions? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Uh, I suppose one, the one question, um, uh, I, I presume the increase in local staff you mentioned is a migration across employers rather than a significant spike in people moving from elsewhere to Waitaki. I'm assuming that the change of contract meant simply that persons who were working for one operation transferred to you. Is that more or less what's happened? Um, I, I would have liked that to happen, Jim, but no, that wasn't quite the case. I think we only ended up with a couple um, from the incumbent when we took on the road maintenance contract. We've actually brought in, I haven't done the numbers to be fair, but it would be at least at least half a dozen uh, that I know have moved to the area um, from outside Invercargill. Um, Oh, sorry, outside of Waitaki from lots of Invercargill, Dunedin. Um, so we've actually seen a lot of people come from different industries, uh, come on board, just want to, want to change. We're offering a lot of, a lot of training. Our, our training budget blew out last year a lot, and a lot of that was just bring on new people, get them through courses, training them up. So, yes. um, so I think it's, it's been a good thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anna. Um, thank you. Through the chair, um, it's good to hear in terms of um, the workforce that are undertaking ongoing training. Do you know if they, if that's at this, you know, at level three, four certificate? I'm just interested because there is regional apprenticeship uh, funding available through MB uh, Venture Timaru. Um, there is some spaces there if you know, like if that central government funding is is needed, um, it'll just help on our side to help advocate for. Training initiatives, if that's helpful. Uh, thank you. That's that is helpful. Um, yeah, some of our training is, is right from the gateway right through to level four. Um, there is a small issue with our, our civil industry, and I'm not, I'm not sure if that's quite covered in some of that, that ITO stuff. But we're certainly something we should be looking on, looking at working together on for sure. Yeah. Yeah, just, just further to that, I mean, there's tens of thousands of dollars available for each apprentice um, through the program that they have. Uh, and they've been charged with responsibility for providing that service throughout South Canterbury and um, North Otago. Uh, and we weren't asked about that one particularly too much, but there's been something around about 100 apprentices in South Canterbury and three uh, from that program in North Otago. So um, very much underdone in this part of the the um the region and you know we have we've we've actually had much more success with mayor's task list for jobs and getting apprenticeships um and through that but uh, that's left the you know, potential funding for us untapped um being run by venture tamaru so uh, something that if we couldn't take advantage of it we absolutely should be um i'm not sure why they're not promoting it more um but uh, that's something that we can have a different discussion on uh, separately to this. Um, right. Well, thank you very much to both of you for, for coming along. Um, apologies for the slight lateness of it, but uh, we'll wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank um, you. So with that, councillors, uh, we will now go to uh, go online and we've got Clive Geddes um, from Amarama Airfield Limited, uh, who's going to join us online and uh, talk about the statement of intent, et cetera.
So uh, welcome, Clive. Uh, good morning, Your Worship, councillors. Right. Um, thanks very much for joining us. And apologies to keep you waiting a wee bit longer than um, hoped for, but uh, appreciate that. So, um, yeah, you, you, we've got your statement of intent. So uh, I guess if you just want to touch on any highlights there or any other comments about um, activity, uh, and we'll see how we go with questions after that. Thank you, Your Worship. Firstly, apologies for not being able to attend in person. Um, it's just this week has turned out to be, uh, or a week ago, this this week turned out to be much busier and I've not been able to get up to Omaru. I think the, um, the reinforcement that we've made into the statement of intent for the 23-24 year is all about strengthening our uh, ties and relationships with the Amerima community. And <clears throat> key to that is the commitment that we've just made, Your Worship, to build a website uh, for the airfield, well overdue. Um, but we have secured amerima.com as our um, address. And uh, we have briefed the web designer to ensure that there are any number of portals that will enable local Amerima businesses to feed into, or we will be able to feed into their websites and vice versa. And we see that as um, being an important function because currently there is not one website which is uh, a representing Amerima Inc, so to speak. So clearly our website will be featuring a lot of the assets that the local community has because they're in fact the assets of the airfield. The second thing is that um, we remain committed to trying as much as we can within our procurement policies to use uh, local uh, businesses and local contractors. Uh, and we will continue that in the coming year. And we will also continue to build our relationships with uh, community organisations like the Board of Trustees for the school and the Amerima Community Association. We're also um, very pleased that uh, Country Time Hotel next door has gone into new ownership. We have been in touch with the owner, who fortuitously is an old friend of mine, uh, and we are looking forward to working with them uh, to enhance both their business our business and, and the business of Amerima Inc. So we um, are positive about the year to come. We've got uh, the Amerima Gliding Club uh, has um, agreed to a comprehensive um, development plan for the coming two years, which involves their employment of a full-time manager for the soaring season two full-time instructors, and they are adding eight to 10 training and cross-country flying courses into their flying program. So we are expecting the airfield to, the activity on the airfield to be significantly above that of the previous two to three years because of this, um, uh, if you like, the gliding club suddenly becoming very energetic. Um, so we are looking forward to the coming year. We understand from the weather experts it's going to be an El Nino year, which is generally good for soaring. Um, so very happy to take any questions uh, or comments that councillors may have in regards to the statement of intent that we have presented to you. Well, thanks very much, Chloe, for that update. And uh, yeah, certainly good news to hear the hotel next door and had new owners. Um, hopefully, uh, looking to invest <laughs> uh, and and maybe update some of the um, some of the original fittings and and fixtures mm -hmm. within that hotel. Um, yeah, seeing a lot of positive things in Amarava. So um, you know, with the the Boots and Jandal Hotel upgrade uh, just yes. opening the last weekend, and you just um, the support that you will be giving, obviously, via your, your website. Uh, really encouraging to hear that as well. Um, so well done on all those fronts. Um, we've got a 
a question or comment from Councillor Holding. Uh, thanks, Clive. Um, just wondering, has the board identified any syn synergies or opportunities with our new designated global geopark status? Um, do you know what we've been doing for the last three years? We've been surviving. <laughs> and, and now that we feel much more confident about our future, um, we will be looking to extend our marketing offer uh, into relevant district-wide marketing office as well. So we are now uh, confident enough to be back talking to uh, the district promotion organization about how we can work collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with other attractions in the district that are uh, relevant to what we're doing. So the answer is no, we have not been, but it is our intention to start a program of working with other uh, district organisations that are in the tourist business. I, I can recommend um, use of a glider to actually see the Osler faults, uh, in, you know, very well defined uh, in that landscape. Um, and obviously, if it's able to loop around past clay cliffs, it's a, a different view of that uh, geosite as well. So some pretty pretty amazing places, um, places available. Uh, and yeah, hopefully there's uh, some really good opportunities to tie in promotion on both. Um, any other questions or comments? Councillor Cowles. Thanks through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Clive, I'd just like to congratulate you on your forward thinking uh, in these small regions and, and getting in amongst the community. Um, these small communities are, are you know, special wee places um, and working with the community and having them on board will make, I'm, I'm sure, will make a, a massive difference. So I just want to congratulate you, Upper Waitaki community. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'm, yeah, we absolutely support that. So um, thank you to you and your fellow board members. Um, again, recognising that you are unpaid and uh, providing a lot of input. Um, a lot of expert input uh, at very cheap rate of nothing. Um, it is appreciated. So uh, thanks for joining us, Clive. Um, quite quite okay that you're online today. Um, hopefully you can get on with the rest of the things for your week. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and I can um, assure you that the board and the company appreciate the support that we get from the Waitaki District Council. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Right, councillors, next we've got Tourism Waitaki uh, sitting excitedly in the wings. Um, so welcome, Philippa and Mike. Um, just grab a seat. It's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, hand over to you, Mike. Kia ora, good morning, Your Worship and councillors. Um, just really want to uh, say, acknowledge the work that Dr. Philip has been doing really over the past period. Um, fantastic job with trends, which was quite a successful event for us. And, and um, she's had a fairly limited sort of a team, but we're on the road to recovery. In fact, uh, tourism throughout the district, thanks to the domestic market, has been quite strong for us, as you would have, would have known. And it's great to see the international tourists coming back in. And that's reflected in the numbers returning to the, uh, to the penguin colony as well. Um, our apologies too, please, from the uh, fellow directors who were to be here. Um, the SOY you've got in front of you, so if there's any questions that we can answer for you, happy to do so. Okay, and just recognising the, the, the challenging times. Um, obviously, we've been through three years of challenging times and with the um, advent of a, an economic development agency and, and the transition to that, um, just acknowledge that uh, all of the work that you and the board have done, uh, Mike and Philip, or you and staff, um, such as it is at the moment, um, particularly you, uh, the efforts that you've put into um, everything up to now. So it is very, very much appreciated. Um, so, councillors, we've got questions, comments, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Mike, and um, uh, I acknowledge or I thank you for thanking Philip because she has um, had a lot to do in the last little while and done it well. I'm just curious, you mentioned a good result at Trend, so can you amplify that a bit? Uh, can you tell what, what particularly were the, were the outcomes that you are so pleased about? 
Um, I guess overall it's about um, building, rebuilding those relationships after COVID. So through the last two years, they haven't held trends in person. Um, so for us, it w it's really important to keep uh, Tourism Waitaki and the, and the district as a whole on the map for not only those trade um, relationships, but other other uh, organisations in the industry. So that was really big for us, is to keep to keep in that space, keep building those relationships. So we had um, ACE from Tourism Waitaki, we had support from the Geopark with Lisa Hines attending and also um, Georgie from the Penguin Colony. So Georgie was able to reconnect with some of the uh, trade operators that we have. So really that's the one for us is that keeping that relationship um, going with our operators and in trade. Stop the answer question, if I may, through you, Mr. Chair. Of course. Um, just uh, I was, what's the, uh, perhaps it's a little premature, but what, what's been the reaction from outside agencies, bodies, groups to, to, to the Geopark news? Uh, so, yes, it trends. Um, Lisa met with some Tourism New Zealand uh, PR people. So, that um, news for them was very positive um actually last week i was sent some of the results of that pr work so they they pushed the news out to their global team and spread it through um a lot of media in australia so that that's all been very very positive Thank you. okay any other questions comments councillor cows yeah mr chair um yeah, well, thank you for all the hard work you are doing. Um, my question is also around trends and the or trends and the trends from there. It's a, it's a bit of a tongue twister that one. Um, what is the? Are we seeing the international markets? I guess I'm asking uh, where they're coming from the most, um, and and you know what's the confidence in that? Um, is it returning to pre-COVID times and? Is there a difference post-COVID um, as to, you know, who we're seeing interested in coming to New Zealand? Um, so probably the markets are consistent to what we were seeing pre-COVID. Um, the Australia market has always been a, a really strong market for us, for the district. Uh, and that's where Tourism New Zealand are pushing back into, um, into the international marketing. Because in the last few years, they have been focusing mostly on the on the domestic market. Um, for the penguin colony, we aren't back to pre-COVID levels uh, because the China market was huge for us. Uh, it made up around 55% of our of our visitor market. And so the the China market is moving slowly because it is um, very expensive for them to travel at the moment. And they're really fresh out of lifting of those restrictions it was only at the start of the year that those that those restrictions were lifted um, but having said that though we are seeing our larger coaches now coming into the colony so it is um while it might feel like we are going back to that pre-covid because we are seeing those coaches um the the marketing push is to attract visitors who want to um stay longer in the country so yes while some of it is beyond our control because it might feel like it's just going to go back to status quo, there is work in that space to try and ensure it's a bit more regenerative. Okay, any further comments? Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the work that you are doing and, uh, yeah, re recognise the, the difficult times at as you progress through and as we progress through the economic development agency scenario. Um, but uh, absolutely thank you for the work that you have been doing. Um, and Philippa, just yeah, yeah, the two workloads that you're carrying at the moment. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Waitaki District Health Services Limited, and we've got the Deputy Chair, uh, Melanie Tavendale, oh, and the Chair, sorry, <laughs> uh, Chair Helen Algar, and CEO Keith Marshall. Um, so, yeah, take a seat, find a seat, whichever one. Um, and with that, we'll hand over to Ellen um, 
for your last appearance as chair of, of, of Waitaki District Health Services with your um, basically finishing in that role on the, the 30th, whatever day that is, um, a few days away. So um, just to um, definitely acknowledge that it's a, a special occasion for you, uh, but also um, uh, yeah, make sure we all do show our appreciation for the massive job that you've had over the time that you've been chair and beyond that when you're a, a, um, a director overall. So thank you for that. I hand to you now. Thank you, Meg Future, for those kind words. I do say I had to, had to run here after all these years. I still don't know how long it takes me to get from work to here. Um, yes, this is my, I guess, final act, really, for Waitaki District Health Services. Um, so I will just pass over to Keith, who will um, present our SOI. And just before I do that, extend my thanks for every to everyone for all of the support that we've had, um, particularly over the last 18 months. It's been much appreciated and we are grateful for it and are happy now to present an SOI that we hope reflects the way forward in the future. Mr Marshall. Um, and I might chip in on the Helen's last day, last appearance. I've been, I'm under the strict instructions not to, so <laughs> as you well know, um, that's my strong point, uh, following instructions. Um, look, <laughs> Helen has been fantastic. We wouldn't have got to this point today if it wasn't for um, Helen's unflagging support and courage through what has been a pretty awful 20 months particularly, and the fact that she had done that for the previous period of time when the board didn't necessarily have all the information that it needed to in front of it in terms about the state of play, I think is a great tribute to the person um, that she is and the way in which she's carried herself. Um, you, you know, without Helen and Helen's presence and knowledge of the sector and the issues that we faced, this job would not have been possible. So I just want to make that really clear from my perspective. And on a personal note, she's just great to work with. So I won't go on. Is that enough? Yeah, that's plenty enough. It was, it was way more than I was allowed. Um, so look, uh, really, really appreciate the opportunity to um, present the SOI. Look, we're still not back at a financial position where we'd all like to be. Um, but I think what you can see here is an incredible step forward from where we've been at any time in the recent past. Certainly the funding contract helps that, but um, and it would be wrong to focus in just on the funding contract and the changes that that's made alone, because actually what sits behind that is the agreement to work alongside Te Whara Ora to continue to develop and get our services uh, and, and hospital back where it needs to be. So I so yes, the funding stuff makes a world of difference to us. Yes, it's great not to have to be here and asking you to completely underwrite the business. That's like a world of um, weight off our shoulders. Um, this year, our going concern assessment is going to be a dream compared to the ones that we have been signing off in the past two years. So that's where we find ourselves. Uh, we still have some challenges ahead in staff recruitment. Uh, last night, we had to restrict access to the hospital because we were short of a uh, doctor who'd phoned in um, sick with COVID, uh, and that led to a mad scramble around how we managed to cover it, but it's a tribute to the team that we were able to do so with uh, no disruption to services and no impact um, or risk to people. And, and in that, I'd pay a huge tribute to Te Whara Ora and St John's in the accommodation and the um, interaction that we had around making that work over what was a one-off um, period. So... Um, and again, you know, I think it's a great reflection on the team that they were able to pull that together in such a short period of time. So uh, it's among the normal hazards of running a hospital, I think, but um, it, it kind of brings it home to roost that actually um, these things do hinge on a few people and point to our key issue here, which is um, recruiting more staff and getting those people in place. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I think it pretty much speaks for itself from there. Yeah. No, just, just on that last one. Um, I know you, you know, the hospital gets a hard time because it can't deliver on some of the services sometimes because of shortages and things. But I think seeing what happens elsewhere, you seem to deliver, you know, keep delivering at times where other hospitals just aren't. And, um, you know, I think that needs to be acknowledged 
that this is a, a nationwide problem, um, shortages of staff and um, some of the challenges around people having to be off because of, of COVID or even, you know, COVID-like symptoms and so forth. And, and in the past, they might have got away with being at work, but not anymore. So, um, yeah, thank you to your team for the extra effort that they go to and make sure that, that the service is there. And um, to those detractors, you know, I think they just, yeah, you know, if they could spend a day in, in the shoes of someone working at the hospital, they might have a different opinion on exactly how easy it isn't to make sure that services remain as steady as they are. So thank you for that. Um, councillors. Councillor Blackler. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kircher. Um, and thanks for the thanks for the report here and um in acknowledgement of Helen. Um, yeah, wish you all the best um, with a wee bit more time. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I just I just had a question around uh, staff par uh, pay parity for nursing, and do we now have alignment with uh, when, when we see a lift in to Fatu order pay rates for nursing? Will our funding reflect the need to align with that, or is there still work to do in that space? It's one of those great questions, Tim. Um, and I could overcomplicate it, as you well know. Uh, the question of pay parity around the health sector is is a tricky one for the Crown to wrestle with, because it is complicated and it, and it runs into a number of other subsectors like. Um, GP practices, the age residential care areas, um, but also a wide range of ancillary things. And we are an independent hospital and we get treated in that regard in terms of the interactions with Te Whara Ora. What we have is a firm undertaking for them to match lifts in pay parity areas which the Crown are prepared to fund right across the whole of the funded sector. So that's the entirety of the health sector. At the moment, that extends solely to nursing. But, but to be fair to Te Whara Ora, that's the only one that's been resolved at this stage in terms of the national award and the conversations. It looks likely that will extend to some other key areas, such as physio, radiology, maternity, um, but those arrangements haven't yet been struck with Te Whara Ora or the union. So it would be premature to, and I certainly wouldn't want to be stealing any government's um, announcement thunder in the course of an election year, would I? Um, so those are yet to be um, negotiated. Um, ASMS, so that's the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists, the senior doctors, Award is currently under negotiation with Te Whara Ora. And again, we have uh, not in, nothing in writing or signed, but we have an undertaking from Te Whara Ora that when those lifts take place, they will also be passed on to the funded sector. I, I think um, notwithstanding whatever those contributions end up being from Te Whara Ora, the one thing I would say about the huge difference it's made to us since moving to fully meeting that pay parity over the last three months is just the wall of additional recruitment that we were suddenly able to make that we previously weren't. So um, we do have to have a conversation with Te Whara Ora about the services mix and the funding that aligns to that, and allied to that is the pay parity issue. Um, but for our services here, uh, you know, and you've heard me draw this line before, but I'll keep drawing it because it's the right one. The Crown should not benefit and subsidise its health services off the back of our staff. And I think whatever the contributions that end up getting made by the Crown, we have to continue to make pay parity for our, for all of our staff. That's so. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Jason. Um, thank you, Helen, for um, the time you, you've served as chair of the, the board. Um, I've got a question. You, you, your letter mentions a whole lot of new obligations that you've had to add to the SOI uh, in order to describe your relationship with Te Whata Ora. Just a question, is that the stuff on page 95 of our agenda? I think it's 6A through J. Is that is that the new material you talked about?
What, what are you referring to? Could you just describe it? Rather oh, than the well, if, the... if, 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 if we go to page 95 of our agenda, yep. at the very top, bracket 6 or V1, and then there's a meet any service standards required under Tifata or a Health New Zealand contractual arrangements by maintaining the following certifications, and then you have A through J. Right. So I'll simply try okay. to establish yep. if that was the new material. Thank you. Um, no, those are, those obligations have been in place for, if not forever, for a very long time. Right. They are a replication of the material in last year's SOI, but actually they were originally taken from an early draft that I found from 2014-15. So what's the new material then? Sorry. Um, not in that. So those are just, that little section there are just the obligations for certification of just being open as a hospital, probably the best way to summarise that. Um, so what I was talking about was in the letter of expectation, the draft letter of expectation that we had seen from the council, you had raised a number of um, issues for the board to consider in terms of bringing forward this SOI. And so we've attempted to address those through the introduction and some other component parts. So talking about the work that we have underway at the moment with Taha or Maru, for example, around looking at how we do some joint services delivery, um, okay. looking at some of that, yeah, so. Well, one other question, if I may, make it through you. Um, on page 91, and then again on 92, there's a reference, and it's a public document. So I'm just curious if you can clarify it. There's a reference on 92 to discussions about the dissolution of the trust. And there's also on page 91, there's a reference to saying that the trust activities are cut. This is the bottom of the page, currently in abeyance. So... Um, can you amplify a little bit about, I mean, I was under the impression that the trust was still operational or extant and doing the Lord's work. Full of life and joy and the vigours of spring, even though that's a few months away. Um, so in terms of the organisational structures that sit within Waitaki District Health Services, there is the limited liability company on the one hand, and there is Waitaki District Health Services Trust yeah. on the other. The trust was originally established around being a, uh, a trust under the Charities Act and acted as our uh, beneficial ability to make donations and array of other things that had provided some separation between the council-controlled trading organisation, the limited liability company on the one hand, and the trust on the other. A few years back, and um, this will probably test all of our memories, but I think it started in 2017, 18, um, there were some discussions about what the purpose of the trust was and how it was being used, because actually the CCO was perfectly entitled, was registered as a charitable company under the Companies Act anyway, and so could act in the right guard, and therefore what was the purpose of the trust? Uh, some work some technical work was done looking at the operations of the trust through um, 2018, 2019, and in 2020, the board had decided that maybe it's a good idea to consider winding up the trust because it served no useful purpose. Um, but at that stage, the health reforms had started um, uh, blossoming into being. And so what we've done for the past, certainly in the time I've been there for the past two years, is really keep that as a paper trust um, so it still exists, it still um, conducts transactions, um, its accounts are consolidated up into our group accounts, um, we report through to the board, I think we only do that twice a year now because there's, no, there's literally nothing happening with the trust, but, but the strategic conversation was let's not be too hasty at banging it on the head just in case it proves useful in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, are there any other questions? Yeah, would someone like to move that we receive the uh, statement of intent? Uh, Deputy Mayor Halalele, Councillor Thompson, second that. Thank you. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. And those against, that's carried. Um, we're now going to move on to item 6.5, which is the letter of support, and uh, be handy to do that while you are here, Keith, because you can uh, possibly respond to any questions. But um, Mr Hope, do you want to introduce the report? Uh, yeah, so this report has just been prepared at the, um, after receiving a request um, from Waitaki District Health Services uh, for uh, a letter of support so that they are uh, you know, very comfortable in passing their going concern test that is required as part of the 
um, financial statements audit uh, for the coming year. So, um, so you've got the uh, the report in front of you. I think the probably something that uh, might be spoken to is yeah, it's uh, a, a far lighter request than in the previous years. It really is just having a facility available rather than uh, a request for direct support or um, a, a request for for funding. So um, yeah, so it is a. Uh, yeah, will be helpful to the audit process. Um, and so that's why it has been presented. I'm happy to answer any questions as I'm sure Mr. Marshall will be. So do we have any questions to discuss the whole thing? So, sorry, I've lost the page, but so it's an underwrite and a letter of support, but if the hospital the was to draw on it, is there, what's the structure of the of the availability? Yeah, so with, with relatively short notice, we can secure funds and we'll pass it across and then just um, we we'll just have an addendum to the existing loan agreement. Um, I think, you know, probably we'll have some discussions about the, the overall uh, structure of the existing loan agreement, but um, at, at a later date, uh, once once there's some, some other financial matters have been uh, dealt with by the hospital. But, yeah, I think. Mr. Mr. Marshall, would you like to comment on that? I think, I mean, it's very helpful that you do put that facility in place. Um, our budgeting for the coming financial year shows that we'll be cash flow positive at the end of it, uh, that its principal purpose is the letter of support showing that the deficit is underwritten for purposes of audit and passing the going concern. I don't anticipate that we would um, be making any request against those funds whatsoever. Okay, anything else? Councillor Hopkins? Yeah, sorry, just to be absolutely clear then, um, so there's no doubt or confusion in the public's mind, what we're offering you is an opportunity to access up to to $1.5 million worth of credit. Um, but what you're saying is you don't anticipate in, any need to, to actually access any of that money. It comes back to the technical question of how do you pass a going concern assessment? And next year, our projected deficit is in the region of 1.1, 1.2-ish. Um, and therefore, that, and we can cash fund that deficit out of our existing position. Um, but for the purposes of passing the going concern, the auditors will want to know that the shareholder um, is in place around the backing of the deficit. And so the conversation that I'd had with Paul was around, it would be helpful for the purposes of easing all of our burdens around the going concern assessment uh, if that support was in place. But we will be cash flow positive at the year end and, and beyond. Thank you very much for that good explanation on that one. Um, right, so I'm prepared to move the motion, Councillor Thompson and second Councillor Limwood. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Okay, I'll put it, those in favour say aye. aye, and those against, that's carried. And um, thank you very much. Um, sorry to rush through things a little bit. We've got 25, 26 minutes left of this meeting to get through a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, yeah, just yeah. So thank you very much for, for being here. Um, thank you, Helen, again, for all you've done. I did a, an acknowledgement in my mayor's report, so if you haven't seen that, seen that um, I'll, I'll get it printed off and frame it and send it to you. Right. Uh, no, it's really appreciated um, what you've done. And i um, not sure whether the deputy chair wants to add some comments on that one. Um, just echoing what was said by the CE and, and yourselves, um, Helen's been an absolute pillar of strength right through this. We've had quite a journey in the last couple of years in particular, but that's not um, forgetting the fact that she's been on the board for much longer than that. Um, so her service to this community, both through the health services and many other areas, is pretty outstanding. Um, and we wouldn't be here without, you know, the teamwork that you see sitting there beside you with Helen and Keith has been pretty phenomenal. And, um, yeah, I think... The board's going to miss having Helen's steady hand at the helm, but I um, want to thank you for everything she's done. Yeah, thank you very much. Right, uh, Mr. Harrison, sorry to keep you waiting for your agenda item. So, um, Councillor 6.4 Transport yeah. Choices Project Endorsement. Um, 
page 38. So through through this year, thank you very much. I appreciate the time to have here and how busy you are. Transport Choices uh, was an opportunity where the Climate Emergency Relief Fund that the government put together was put to out to um, all councils to actually look at how we could actually reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, light vehicles. And that was significant identified around that the light vehicles were the significant contributor. Um, that went out with, uh, to all the councils, all 76 of us, um, and 46 replied. Waka Kotahi, on behalf of the Minister, um, assessed those and took everything on board. Um, there was a $350 million allocation. Um, they, sorry, Waka Kotahi, as when I'm saying they, the initial allocation or the starting point was a $450 million group of projects from all 46 councils. Basically, they said no to almost, they said yes to almost everything, which was very convenient for them to celebrate success. As we've got on through it, they've been looking around what they, how they need to actually manage within 350 million. Um, so they needed to cut 100 million out of the projects. Um, so they started looking around how this was approved, how it was identified, um, and how they could rationalise it. So on the 6th of June, um, there was a paper released that says this is the complying activities. If we had known that at the start, our starting point would have been quite different. Um, the transport choices money that has been made available was all government money. So for the application that we made, there is no local share involved. So it's 100% coming from the government. Um, we put together um, the um, projects where we looked around what was happening on the highway because that was the spine of our network and how it's contributing to the lack of choices for people to travel by different modes. So that walking, cycling, mobility devices, a whole range of things, and to reduce vehicle, vehicle kilometres travel because um, we've got 80% of our traffic on our local uh, urban roads. We can make a, a notable reduction in vehicle kilometres travel without affecting those that have to travel uh, because our rural community will always travel. Um, we've got the local community where a large portion of it is locally. So if we had a good infrastructure where people could choose other modes, we could make our contribution to it. Um, my calculation is we'd easily eat the 20% by 2035 that the government was looking for. But um, we were faced with a choice around Waka Kotahi, as the Transport Choices team said, this is what we can invest in. So they, I made the list there of what they can invest in. You'll notice it's very cycle-centric. Um, maybe that's my own view on it, um, but uh, that's certainly what they said. So we were looking at um, intersections, which is going to improve the efficiency, of our network as far as the cars and vehicles moving around and therefore the safety for people crossing. That was decided that that was actually into too much of an infrastructure build. And we have gone through six months almost of Waka Kotei setting in place a number of processes where they could sign things off um, and it was all internal processes. That six months means we can no longer deliver those projects because we can't get the materials. There's almost a 12 month delay for a signal hardware, that's the posts, the poles, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and in a position where this project has to be delivered by um, the 30th of June, 2024. Uh, and that is all bills paid. Um, after that, it becomes totally the council's responsibility. So for us, we've got to look at now, what can we deliver by my view on it is 30th of April. That gives us a bit of a leeway around other delays because there's always delays. Um, what they have then said is what actually delivers on um, the walking and cycling or the, the alternative modes, active modes, if you will. Um, and it was narrowed down to uh, the side road crossings and the crossings across the highway. So that's around those narrow parts of the modes. Also, um, can that be delivered? Um, we're now at a point where what I'm looking for here is to go to market, see whether we've got the pricing right. Uh, with the more importantly, the time frame to deliver is whether that's the case. Um, these um, significant projects, or these parts of it here, the side road crossings, there is 15 of them set on here along the state highway. They are all Waka Kotei or Transit New Zealand, uh, sorry, yeah, um, New Zealand Transport Agency infrastructure sites. So if we wanted to do them as far as council is concerned, we cannot get money from the Land Transport Fund for those because they're not our network. So this is an opportunity where we can get something for our, our community if we see that's the right thing to do. Um, in the future, if we don't do it now as part of the, this fund, um, we would have to convince Waka Kotei to prioritise those sort of activities over everything else nationally for the state highway. Um, and they are too busy because we have been talking to them about these intersections, a number of things for the four years I've been here. And I know that goes back uh, more than a decade with my predecessors talking to Waka Kotei 
and they just haven't got to that level. So this is around what we can get the funding for. This funding is allocated uh, for these projects and these projects alone. Um, it cannot be relocated to anything else. Um, and Waka Kotahi, as in the transport fund, transport choices fund is keen to actually recover as much as they can because they are looking to save $100 million uh, over the next um, just short of 12 months. Um, and as part of that, they also want to deliver everything um, because the previous project they had was the um, Innovative Streets, if you recall, and that failed because it didn't, it failed on the outcomes because they didn't get enough delivered in the time frame because it just ground indefinitely. At this point here, I'm saying, um, I'm asking to actually endorse what we've got to go to market and to see what can be delivered. The end up, the detailed designs, we're still working through those and we'll do that during the tender phase. So at the time we come with a tender close, we'll have more detailed drawings. So I, you know, that we're running in a very short time frame to get everything uh, put together. Hopefully that gives you a bit of background, but the key thing is this is not local money, this is government money. It's these projects that money can be applied to, we can't relocate it to anything else. And these projects are ones, or these intersections and the crossings have come from our school surveys, where parents have actually said, we don't feel comfortable with the safety for our children to walk to school because of these points. Also from our age sector, from the disability um, uh, action um, groups, they're saying that they're finding the accessibility across these crossings, the steepness of the um, steepness of the getting up onto the footpaths and the length of crossing across the road is, a, is an issue. So we haven't picked these out of the year. They're actually something that has been an issue for some time um, and it's addressing those community uh, concerns. Um, happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mike. Um, Councillor Blackler. Uh, thank, thanks, Mike. Um, I just had a, a specific question about um, the detail on page 42 of the report around the pedestrian crossings uh, to be up, upgraded to uh, signal control. Um, and I understand there's um, specific criteria and stuff that we have to meet, but on the back of the original intersection work now being um, put on the back, back burner, is there an opportunity to reconfigure the layout of that to satisfy the need of the pedestrian and also vehicle movements. Because you, you can see that they're just slightly up the road from some of the intersection points that were highlighted as um, points of issue originally. Through the chair, um, the final detailed designs haven't been done. Either. There's a couple of the crossing points where I do want to look at a bit with a bit more detail just to see whether that's um, exactly the right thing to do. I'm not convinced that signalised crossing is still 100% the way to go. It may be around mid-block uh, crossings. If you look at the crossing point that runs um, towards the uh, showgrounds, um, and sorry, I can't say the exact street name on that, but the one that's there at the moment, it doesn't perform particularly well because of the way it's actually formed. Can we do something as an upgrade to that rather than signalising? Uh, I want to push it a bit further. So um, even the location of, this, uh, of the crossings can be revised. Um, most of them are actually well positioned. The one by the New World is not. Um, Etrick Street, I think. Um, Councillor Percival. Yeah, through the chair. Um, Mike, you have confirmed a couple of times that that is totally funded by NZTA, which is a bit of a relief because it is a major, major uh, costing. Um, could NZTA use that as a lever to reduce our applications for funding within our network? That's one question, because by utilising that CRF fund, they could claim it as being their own initiatives, if you know where I'm coming from with that. And also, if you did mention work to be completed by June next year, if the proposed work is not completed, would you abandon or avoid further work on that project rather than rate funded? That makes sense. <laughs> Through the chair, uh, thank you for that. Um, um, can they actually reduce um, our application under the National Land Transport Fund? No, they're two separate processes as such. 
Um, this is something, because it's the State Highway Network, um, it's an opportunity here. It doesn't affect their local network funding at all. Um, I've got no effort. The second question is around what happens come the end of the year around going to uh, local authority money. I've got no appetite for that whatsoever. Um, and that's either we, if we can't achieve it and it comes through at the tender time, we don't accept the tenders. If we're going through the project and it's being delayed to that stage, we'll have to abandon parts of it and just deliver what we can. So that's what we need to write into our document. At the end of the day, where there's no, there can no, can be no opportunity where council money needs to go into this, from my view. Councillor McCain. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, the guys pretty much covered off everything I was going to ask. Just one question, Mike. So the proposed raise, is that very similar to what's been done on the on the streets, offshoots of Reed Street? Is that what you're proposing for some of these intersections? Yes, that is correct. So Reed Street is um, similar, um, excepting that the raised platforms, if you call them that, on the side roads would be where the crossing is, so it gives a smoother um, entrance way for those that are in um, they say wheelchairs, mobility devices, uh, even for walking. So you'd have a very much at grade going from your pedestrian, from your footpath to your footpath across the road. Thank you, Councillor Linwood. Thank you. Um, say the three signalised crossings go in. How would that? Um, uh, how would that? Say so if, if it were oh, to go sorry. to go through. How would it affect the congestion already out there that goes on? Because those intersections are already really difficult to get out of. So if the crossings were in the middle. Through the chair, um, I was very interested that Waka Kotei were keen to support the signalised crossings um, because it didn't make a lot of sense to me in some ways. However, looking at it, um, the congestion can actually be controlled. When people push, the, they're actually uh, on-demand crossing, so they're not a timed basis. So you push the button, they turn red. That creates a break in the traffic, so it will actually help the side road traffic to turn right on and off. That's a plus. The real negative that I'm concerned about is when somebody pushes the button, all of a sudden there's a gap in the traffic and they walk across, and all of a sudden you've got a red light coming up and traffic stopping for it, and there's nobody to cross. That causes frustration. So there is historical ways where they have um, sensor pads where the lights stop working if the people move off them. Um, they had mixed success. I uh, want to keep on looking at that. Um, but yes, uh, I think that's a valid question. Um, I believe the disbenefit of having the signalised lights will also balance against having that interruption because we do see it with the signalised lights uh, in the, by the four square um, that it does break the traffic so people can get across. So um, it can go both ways. The Europeans have a good system where after a short time that changes to a uh, from from a red light to a flashing amber, which means if there's someone on the crossing, you've got to stop. But if there's not, you're allowed to go. I think we're a wee way behind the times on that one. Um, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, Mike, I'm sorry. I'm trying, trying to get a he my head around what exactly um, we would be voting to um, uh, Endorse. I'm just we we we're supposedly one is says we will endorse the Waka Kotahi approved transport choices. Now then, there's a reference on page 41 to a whole bunch of streets that have been accepted into the stage three delivery program. Not that we've ever discussed that. There's a reference on page on the next page to upgrading of crossings and so on. But then the maps or the illustrations from 46 onwards show a raised crossing in Raglan Street and what looks like four additional raised crossings with traffic lights in Thames Highway. And is that the sum total of what we're now endorsing? Because if it is, I don't think we should. Through the chair, um, the, um, those are indicative crossing details for what was likely to be built. Uh, the Raglan Street indicated is one of 15 side roads through there, so it's the same thing applies up there um, to all the other ones. There is two types of crossings, uh, two types of side roads here because you have the high um, pro, high, um, pro, high vehicle ones, the likes of um, uh, Regina, um, sorry, Arundel Street, Red Class or Road. We have a lot of heavy traffic going up them. There's also Frome Street has a lot of uh, heavy traffic and we have buses going up to the school buses going up to the um, Pembroke School through there. So those um, three, I think it is key intersections will have a slightly different 
design profile to the lights and raglan street which will be more um, local roads um, provided for but part of that we've also got vehicles that go to service all those um, those streets the likes of the uh, gas trucks the rubbish trucks the street sweepers so there is a minimum level of what it needs to be um, so yeah there's the 15 intersections and then there is up to the four um, crossings across the state highway sorry so the, the information in front of us is misleading. In my view, we haven't discussed the 16 streets and we should have had a chance to do so before we signed it off. Um, uh, if if we're going to do the work on our side streets, so be it, at the, at the Crown's expense. If Waka Kutahi wants to put traffic lights and raise pedestrian crossings across its highway, then that's its business. And I see no merit in, in, in us engaging in that process whatsoever. And And I don't think this report has given us a clear idea of what we're actually voting for when you ask us to endorse the choices. It's not satisfactory in my view. Sorry, but it isn't. I think this is predicated on the basis that, you know, we want to make sure our community is safe. Um, and sometimes Waka Kotahi is less concerned about pedestrians than they are about uh, making sure vehicles get from one part of their network to another part. And so it's looking at that, but um, I take your point that we we haven't signed off the detail of this um, until, yeah, we've got the opportunity today. Um, but I do wonder whether there's a, you know, a, a rider in there that allows the roading subcommittee to um, continue to be engaged with through the process. So I just make that point. Um, Councillor Holding and then Councillor McCain. Just in regards to that, Mike, with the, um, you've gotten here about the, under community engagement, they'll be testing bollards and speed cushions. So is that, is that, is that a mock temporary raised bed? And if the feedback is not palatable, we'll get a go from there. Through the chair, um, that was the intention there was to, in the past, we've actually uh, moved from pretty much this stage to actually building the uh, the permanent solution. So we're trying, suggesting at this stage to go and put some um, temporary um, markers uh, with a road marking or uh, bollards in place to actually show people where the movement's going to be, how it's going to affect them, so we can actually adjust our design if we need to or totally remove it. Um, that um, trial, once again, would also be fully funded, funded by the project. Um, just going back to what uh, Councillor Hopkins was saying, um, I just want to say, clarify that as of yesterday, um, the Waka Kotahi have no appetite to putting uh, raised platforms for pedestrian crossings across the highway um, because nationally that's proved to be somewhat um, of an issue. Um, they want to address that later on um, with the speed limit reviews for the highway uh, places around the schools. So um, at this stage, we're looking at signalising and creating an improved um, zebra crossing, if you will, between. So that'd be likes of a, I think most of you will have seen the red painting across the crossings with the zebra lines painted on them. So it's likely to be that with the signalised, uh, but it'll be no raised platform across the highway. Uh, Councillor Holding? So, sorry, finished? Uh, I know. Oh, 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 oh. One aspect I did like that about the equitable access that probably having those raised things down the other intersection is going to make it easier for the elderly and mobility scooters and for that. So I'll just leave that a comment. Okay, no, thank you. Councillor McCain. Just two or three other things. So this work is, we've got a time frame to do it in. If it can't be done, do you have an itemised priority of what can be done in that time frame would be the first question. And secondly, with the raised platforms, you know, Accessibility to large trucks gets restricted, uh, especially if they're turning off a highway because they've got to get square on, otherwise they can tip their load and then things can get messy pretty quickly. So would they be further down the street if you have to do them or why do you have to do them at all as opposed to raising a platform off the edge of the pedestrian so it's a gentle climb on both sides for, for access on, on and off crossing the road? through the chair, um, that design has to come through. Yes, the turning of the heavy vehicles is important to actually go through there. That's why I'm saying some of them do need to work for what is servicing those streets, because that's your residential streets. And Raglan Street is a good example where um, really you shouldn't, arguably, um, the question I'd have is, do you need to have truck and trailers going down there? Um, and do you actually uh, direct those? So that would be the intention there. 
um, to actually have a fit for purpose um, um, situation where it does apply appropriately. So the thresholds or the race platforms on the likes of um, um, Arundel Street or Redcastle Road would be different to the other ones. Um, just want to make a point. So your approval here today is not a final approval. It's an approval that I can go to market and start finding out what can be delivered in the time frame and the, and the dollar value we have. Um, from that, it's going to come back um, through the committee, if you will, or as to a final point saying, can it be delivered? Is it delivering on the outcomes that we're looking for? So um, if we need to drop anything out, um, that's what we'd be certainly looking at that time. Um, maybe not obvious enough, we haven't spoken here, what, uh, we are still looking at the opportunity to improve the footpath, the full length, so two and a half kilometres of the footpath, because at the moment that western side footpath of the highway is of a mixed quality for slope. Um, Councillor um, Holding did actually have an opportunity pushing a lady around in a wheelchair around how the slopes and footpaths were quite an issue, so that was what looking at the, some of the footpaths up there are at a steepness where you can't actually manage on those sort of frames, and even on a bike, walking through it's quite difficult so that's a preference locally here to get that um we have got sign off from the waka kotahi to actually still consider that but it has to be delivered um the reason why it's a question to being delivered is that you can't just go and raise the footpath because it's the curb and channel it's the deciding factor at the moment so that would need to come up so that is part of the project if we could deliver it that's holding sorry i went a wee bit off track but i know a lot of a lot, a lot of this Purpose is trying to get more people biking and uh, different modes of transport. Did, did we look at just putting some more money into getting the existing bike track extended or better and getting them right off the road or sort pass all together? Through the chair, the surveys we did showed that the desire line was through the highway. So um, there will always be some people that are prepared and wish to go into another route, particularly on a uh, recreational cycle one. But from commuter cycling, which is a significant level of uh, cycling, is the highway is the connecting point. If you go out there at sort of uh, 20 to 9 through to just after 9 o'clock, depending on which time the kids get to school, you'll notice that it's very, very full in the morning and the afternoon, but also lunchtime. And it's a very social sp space as much as a commuter space because the people um, cycling and walking as schools is uh, all the schools traveling together in mass. Um, and it's it, you know, like I say, it's more, it's as much that social space as anything else. And Deputy Mayor Hunter. Uh, through the chair, just a question, uh, Mr. Harrison. So I just want to be clear. So the the pedestrian crossings to be upgraded. Um, so there's three of them. And then one is at Redcastle Road, one is at New World Rainbow Confectionery, and the other one is outside is by Pembroke School. So those are the only three. Is that what you're saying? That'll be signal control. I just want to understand it in my head. I'm familiar with those crossings is what I'm saying because they're very busy and there's children, you know, like crossing them all the time. Um, so if there's anything to support their safety as well as accessibility, then I'm supportive of it. I just want to be clear in my mind. Through the chair, that is correct. The um, just the other suggestion there is that with um, with making a change to those crossings, we're also going to look at the current signalised crossing at the four square to make that a, a similar sort of shape and form. Um, if you look at trying to actually walk from the footpath up to Brito, push the button on the signal lamps at the moment, um, that's quite a challenge with the gradient there. So the we would be looking at that one as to improve to make a change there to improve the level of service. Councillor Thompson. To progress the conversation, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to move um, that uh, we give approval for this planning to take place, bearing in mind that it will come back um, once we've established whether we can do it, um, and um, we'll have a final sign-off. Um, on that, would you like there to be ongoing engagement with the writing subcommittee, which you chair? Um, that is correct. That's yeah. what I say. We'll have to okay. come back for sign off. So if we, um, so we've got one through five there. But if we can add a two in there, which is request that there is ongoing engagement with the roading subcommittee, being becoming number two, and then the two, three, four, five become three, four, five, six. Yeah. Um, so you're happy to move that? And right. Councillor McCone, second that. Oh, sorry, I'd like to move the amendment that I made. 
simply that the um, first word is one to change from the daughters to receives. Won't have any other effect, but it is it simply means that we've received it rather than absolutely saying yay to it. At this point, we're even second to the next day now. I think we might need something more yeah. definitive than that to um, allow staff to get on and take action because at the moment we're not really well, allowing them that with uh, we just receive information that's not giving sufficient okay for them to go ahead and do work on it. Uh, Councillor Thompson, your um, No, Mr Mayor, I'm not uh, prepared to um, support that change. Um, it, it's very much smacks of... Um, uh, a political statement in a process that's not actually political. Um, Waka Katahi have, have signalled the funds for this. We're accepting the funds and getting on with it. Okay, so it's not uh, accepted as a change of wording, but if you want to move an amendment, you can certainly well, do that, it, and then I'll, second, so then I'll seek a second to... Sorry? If you if you move at the processes, then I will see uh, to see if there's a seconder. Well, I move that the word endorsement becomes received. Okay. Do we have a seconder for that? Shot down in flames. Yes. <laughs> Merciless. Uh, okay. So we've got it moved and seconded. Um, right. So, Deputy Mayor Halliday, do you want to speak to that? I was just an additional comment um, noted on page 42, the communication and engagement plan. Um, just if, that, if the portfolio holders with the governance team could be engaged with that process as well. Okay. Uh, Councillor Holding. So I might kind of ask some question with the projects that were, were uh, didn't, that you've done some work on that didn't uh, happen or weren't accepted. What, what happens to that work that's been done? Through the chair, we have the plans done for that. So if you wanted to see, we have um, done uh, concept drawings with uh, movement, uh, vehicle movements for um, all of those signalised um, crossings. We've also got about three uh, roundabout options for um, Aomar Road. Um, we've done the SIDRA, which is the, um, don't ask me what the SIDRA stands for, but it's efficiency of the traffic signals, how the traffic move. Um, and that shows that by doing that work, the um, efficiency of the highway retains substantially um, as what it is at the moment. Making any change will be a reduction in, in efficiency in some ways, but it's substantially the same. So we have those, um, and it does give us something we can actually move forward to. Um, we can actually cost from those two to see what the dollar value is, um, and we'll ask con contractors to around how the deliverability on them. So. Um, that's a step towards um, shovel ready. If you wanted to say in the future, we might be able to look at those. Um, but there is no appetite from highways to get involved with those as far as the no National Land Transport Fund in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Comments? I'll put it um, those in favour of one through six with number two being the additional uh, engagement with the subcommittee. Uh, please say aye. Uh, and those against, no. that is carried 10-1. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, that's the end of our public items. So I asked someone to uh, move that we go into public excluded. Councillor Cowles, thank you. And Councillor Linwood, thank you. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. And against, that's carried. Um, just note that we are um, into lunchtime, but we'll carry on for another 10 minutes and, and get through what we can. So thank you very much to all those who have joined the live stream.